Okay, we're about to go live on YouTube. So we're gonna be able to start in a minute. I'll start recording. Is this showing up okay? Yes, everything looks okay. Fantastic. So I think we can start when you, when you want, Peter. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, in that case, welcome everyone to Cesaric 21 Centimeter 2022. My name's Peter Sims and I'm an MSI Fellow at McGill University and one of the co-chairs of this conference along with Adelie Gorse. Hi. Uh, it's fantastic to have you all here with us today. Before we get started uh, with this, this very exciting science program, Adelie and I have a few notes of introduction and logistics. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank the members of the organizing committee who are all listed here on the slide, uh, as well as helping us run the conference this week. Everyone played an important role in its planning, as well as in selecting the talks, uh, which Adley will say a little bit more about in a second. So thanks again to everyone on the organizing committee for helping with that. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Stephen Wilkins for suggesting that we add this second longer form Cesarac conference uh, on the 21 centimeter cosmological signal to the annual Cesarac calendar to complement the existing long form summer Cesarac. Uh, we hope that the between these two newly coined Cesarac gulps, uh, along with the more specialized SIPs, Cesarac will provide the community with a great picture of both sides of the high redshift astrophysics coin, the galaxies themselves, and the surrounding intergalactic medium. The second motivation for Cesarac 21 centimeter is to bring together 21 centimeter cosmologists working both at low and high redshift, as well as on experiments focused on measuring the sky average 21 centimeter signal uh, and fluctuations. And with the exciting results emerging in all of the subfields, uh, to provide an additional forum to update each other on our work, to discuss the remaining challenges ahead and to foster new ideas and collaborations. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, so my, I'm Adelie, I'm an MSI fellow uh, as well at McGill University. And I'm gonna introduce a little bit, um, tell you a little bit about the abstract submission and selection process and give you a bit of statistics because we are cosmologists, so we love statistics. Um, so we had 84 submissions uh, for abstract, which is really good. And uh, as you can see from the pie chart on the right, uh, most of the contributions were from early career researchers, so postgrads, postdocs, and uh, senior postdocs. And actually most of the contribution above all were from postgraduate students, so that is great. We had one uh, contribution from an undergraduate student who ended up being selected for uh, a live talk, so that is great as well. And we had a question about the preferred pronouns of uh, the speakers, which allowed us to do a little bit of uh, gender distribution statistics. And so you can see on the pie chart on the bottom right, uh, the, the distribution is pretty much equivalent to what we used to uh, in the field. And we'll see how that holds after selection in a minute. Um, we did a little word cloud with uh, all the submitted abstracts. And if it's not surprising to notice that the word that was most commonly used is signal, I mean, it is in the title of the conference, right? The 21 centimeter signal, a uh, cosmological signal. Uh, the, well, interestingly, the second most used word was will. So that shows that there's a lot of um, exciting science to be expected from 21 centimeter cosmology, but it is not only in the future. Uh, as I think the speakers from our sessions today, which is focused on the uh, updates on experiments and observations, are going to uh, demonstrate. So let's move on to the selection process. Um, so the abstract selection, selection was completely blind. The SOC only had access to the title and the abstract of each submission to assess it. So that allowed us to keep similar proportions between submission and selected talks uh, in terms of academic position, to have two fifths of students, two fifths of postdocs, and one fifth of uh, tenured track or tenured scientists. In terms of uh, gender, we have uh, roughly the same proportion of um, speaker identifying as non-binary in the submissions and the selected talks, but uh, in the selected talks, we have a higher proportions uh, from uh, speakers identifying as female than in submission, uh, which I think is a really good sign, including uh, because 
the selection was completely blind. So all the talks were assessed purely on merit. So if you're interested in all these issues, I encourage you to uh, either start a conversation or contribute in the uh, Slack channel dedicated to uh, equity and inclusion. Uh, and I'll hand over to Peter. Okay, great. And um, here we have our schedule for the week. Uh, we have updates on experiments today. Tomorrow, we are moving on to foregrounds, instrument collaboration, and cross correlations. Um, modeling uh, takes us on Wednesday. And finally, on Thursday, we have more cross correlations and finishing with space and lunar based observations. You can uh, join Slack channels for each of these sessions, which are labeled as shown here. Um, one, two, three, four for the days and AB for the session numbers during the days. Uh, all of the talks are being recorded uh, and live streamed on YouTube. Uh, the recorded talks will also be uploaded to YouTube after uh, the fact, and we'd like to thank Will Roper very much for his assistance with that. And moving on to our final uh, item of logistics, uh, we would please ask everyone to review and follow the guidelines in the code of conduct that's available on the Cesaric website. Uh, so that we can just ensure that everyone feels comfortable and happy to express themselves during the conference. If anyone does encounter any problems, please contact a member of the SAC uh, via Slack or the 21 Centimeter email address. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand the floor on to our chair for the first session, Josh Dillon. Morning. Uh, well, thank you for, for uh, the opportunity to chair here. And I'm, I'm excited for this conference. And I want to thank uh, Peter and Adelie and the entire SOC. So round of applause already for putting together what looks like an amazing conference. So let's, uh, let's start with our first speaker, uh, which is Matt Dobbs, who's going to be telling us about broadly observations of 21 centimeter uh, emission at low redshift. We are seeing your Slack. There we go. So I'll give you a, a two minute warning. Great, thank you. And, and do I have 25 minutes or 30 minutes? You have 25 plus five for questions. Sounds great. Okay, um, let's let's kick off the workshop shop then by talking about the 21 centimeter uh, signal in our local universe. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to show you some early results from Chime. I'm going to focus on the Chime experiments and the Cord experiment, but other talks uh, in, in this in this session um, are 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 going to are going to focus on other experiments as well. So so we'll have a rounded view of things. Let's start by putting this in perspective. Um, the field of 21 centimeter over the last oh, two decades or so has really uh, centered its, its excitement in, in the early days around the signal from 21 centimeter that allows us to see back through cosmic time all the way towards uh, the microwave background and focusing on, on the, the neutral universe and its transition through reionization. So, so much of what we've, we've uh, seen historically uh, in, in terms of that excitement are, are these signals. Once we go through reionization, of course, most of the universe transitions from uh, neutral to ionized and the 21 centimeter signal it, uh, becomes greatly attenuated by uh, the reduced amount of hydrogen that's there. So, um, but about two or 3% of, of, uh, of the hydrogen in the universe remains um, unionized and, and gives us a, a good signal to look for. Now, you might think that since there's only a, a few percent here that it's a harder signal to see that's really not the case because what really matters is not how bright this signal is. We have the sensitivity to see it at many of these redshifts. What really matters is the ratio of the brightness of the signal to the brightness of the foregrounds. And when you look for the 21 centimeter signal at redshift two, or you look for it at redshift eight, that ratio is very, very similar. So those, those things roughly uh, uh, cancel out in terms of the challenge of, of, of this science. The other important thing at low redshift is that we're looking for a signal, the baryon acoustic oscillations, for which we roughly know the scale. At some redshifts that we're probing, we exactly know the scale. And, 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 and so it ends up being a Fourier scale that is well known on the sky. Our target is uh, uh, something we can really tune our experiments to see. 
So in today's talk, I'm going to show you the state of the art in, in seeing the sky at low redshift and uh, uh, where we are so far on our pursuit to reveal the baryon acoustic oscillations through 21 centimeter intensity mapping. Um, let's take the, the universe that I just showed you and, and put it on a more linear scale uh, to see exactly what we're probing. We have the cosmic microwave background on the left and just you know, to remind everyone, the uh, the anisotropies that we see there are the very same scales, are the very same physics that we'd like to trace through all cosmic time. We'd like to see how, how these evolve as a function of redshift. And most importantly, we'd like to look back beyond the time of dark energy domination to a matter dominated universe and see that transition and see if it obeys uh, the, the vanilla uh, dark energy equations that uh, we have grown to take as standard, but maybe creating some tension in the cosmologies that we're measuring with different probes on the night sky. So the low uh, redshift uh, to, uh, 21 centimeter then is roughly 80% of this diagram from today back to about when the universe was one fifth of its, its age and back to a time when we're quite sure there was very little uh, dark energy in, in, in the evolution of, of the universe. Now, the way that we probe baryon acoustic oscillations locally is by finding galaxies and painstakingly measuring the redshift of each of these galaxies and then forming a two point correlation function. What is the average separation between galaxies? And that uh, scale is the red circle that's shown on the right and a very early uh, view of the universe uh, is, is, is shown here where each dot represents a galaxy. This is an expensive and time consuming way to, to do a census of the universe and measure scales. Uh, not just because you have to measure each galaxy, but also because the physics involved with uh, deciding, uh, modeling whether a galaxy is bright enough to see and how that changes with star formation with other things in the history of the universe is relatively complicated. Now to make this very same measurement, how, how far apart the galaxies are, it, it suffices not to measure individual galaxies, but to blur these out and put a coarse beam on the sky uh, to, to see the integrated emission of many, many galaxies in each beam. Um, the beam that I've applied here is similar to what we have with Chime, and you can see that the scales of interest are still represented. You don't have to measure individual galaxies if you're fortunate enough to, to be able to measure the whole sky as a function of frequency or redshift and somehow get rid of the foregrounds that are obscuring this view. To give folks a sense of scale, uh, in, at redshift one-ish, the baryon acoustic oscillation first peak is at three degrees, so it's enormous. Uh, from, from the scale of, of what's easy to measure. Um, and along the line of sight, looking down through the beam of the telescope, the separation of, of the ripples is about 20 megahertz. Down at the far end, where an experiment like Chime, Chime measures at redshift two and a half, that narrows down to one degree and about half uh, the, the frequency separation of the ripples. Now, sadly, this evolution is exactly the opposite of what our instruments do for us. If I build a telescope and I have a maximum baseline of 100 meters, then uh, at, at the frequency that probes the near universe, I have the best angular resolution. And at the far redshift, so at, at the lowest frequency for that same fixed telescope, I have the worst uh, angular resolution. So as I design these instruments and play this game, the uh, scale of the instrument, how big it is, how many feeds it has and so forth is really driven by the high, high redshift portion of this measurement where I need to have a baseline that's big enough to uh, uh, um, uh, see the BAO and has the frequency resolution to separate the ripples. Okay. Now, Going after this science, we have the technology, we've demonstrated it on, on the night sky in terms of sensitivity. The name of the game is not to see the signal in, in terms of brightness, but the name of the game is to design an experiment that, it ha that allows us to separate the systematics from the signal, that allows us to characterize our instrument at, at, at a level that uh, doesn't allow um, uh, foregrounds to masquerade is the science we're after. The name of the game in this field is uh, control now, as opposed to sensitivity. Um, the, the, 
the main experiments I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you some early results from is the CHIME experiment. I, I think people in, in this community are familiar with it in terms of its cylinders and how it sees the sky. But really what our team is doing in terms of, of, of putting together our data analysis, the way we calibrate, the way we uh, uh, rigidize and uh, um, uh, keep track of the variations of, of this instrument is exactly the same uh, as, as what you need to do for any drift scan telescope. So um, our first detection of a stacked result of 21 centimeter emission, uh, the paper we, we put out a few weeks ago or a month ago um, is about 50 some pages long. And the majority of that is in establishing the techniques, the algorithm and the algorithms and the ways to do this science with a drift scan telescope like CHIME. This telescope, like so many others in the 21 centimeter field has no moving parts. It has no ability to point within its, uh, to, to steer its, its primary beam. And so there's no time allocation committee. There's no need to sit around in a room and figure out what to look at and where to look at. It sees the entire overhead sky once per night. Um, and it does that for all time, for all time that you can manage to keep your telescope running. Um, the data rate though is just gigantic. There's 13 terabits per second flowing through this monster. And we have no hope of storing that data. So we have to uh, uh, take the data and in some cases, like when we look for fast radio transients, we build something like a particle physics machine. We put in a trigger and we keep just a tiny fraction of the data that has interesting changes on the sky. For our cosmology applications, we have to look up four more visibilities and then integrate essentially forever. In the case of CHIME, we take our data at a nanosecond and we integrate to, to uh, 10 seconds. Um, so that's a, a, a huge step. Beyond that, we don't have the ability, we don't have the disk space to store, store every visibility separately. So we have to co-add redundant baselines. What all this boils down to is that we're running an experiment that needs to be at some level calibrated on the sky. And some portion of these calibrations are things that we've done to the data to co-add it that we can't go back and undo. We have to learn as we go. And as we make these changes, it means the data before it. Uh, uh, will be uh, corrupted without having that. Uh, the telescope was built by collab uh, a collaboration of, of the prime uh, builder institutions at, at uh, the University of Toronto, the University of British Columbia, McGill University, and the TRAO, uh, Canada's National Radio Facility, and has partners at Yale, MIT, West Virginia, Perimeter, and NRAO. Just to, um, for, for folks that aren't used to looking at the sky through a cylinder, it works as uh, uh, something like this. Again, in, in this talk, I'm, I'm talking about chime and cylinders, but uh, we have many exciting talks in, in, in this session, but I particularly want to point people towards uh, uh, Devin's talk on Hyrax, uh, which is an upcoming uh, dish-based experiment, and Peter's talk on Tianle, which has all of the same challenges in terms of uh, being drift scan telescopes uh, that, that are mapped onto either cylinders or dishes in these cases. So if I take a cylinder and I put a feed in the center of it and look up at the night sky, the night sky being the blue circle, it casts a cigar-like beam on the sky, which is shown here. This is one feed in one cylinder. And that looks something like this. At the latitude of the DRAO, the, um, then each day as the earth rotates, the entire overhead sky rotates through our beam. And you can see that we have very, very different observing as a function of uh, elevation on the night sky. The, um, the, north, the North Celestial Pole is here and it's always in view. The area around the North Celestial Pole rotates very rapidly and, uh, 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 sorry, rotates slowly and spends a lot of time in our beam. Whereas way down here in the South, we have a slow rotation and uh, we, we spend only you know, something like uh, 15 minutes with each part of the sky in view. If, if I take that and cast it on, on uh, the Haslam uh, radio sky and have a beam shape, it looks like this. Let's take 16 feeds and place them in a cylinder. At this point, with a big signal processing backend, I can divide up the information and, and beam form in various directions. Uh, it, I've shown 16 different beams here, but of course I get all the information that sits between these beams as well with the angular resolution divide, uh, defined by the beam area divided by the number of feeds. If I build cylinders in the other direction, I'm able to uh, divide up the information in, in uh, the east-west direction as well. And this represents how an experiment like CHIME uh, sees the night sky. In our case, we have 256 uh, elements along the north-south direction in this direction and four elements in that direction. And that uh, defines our angular resolution. 
When we look at the sky, we're doing it through a four leaf, uh, a clover like antenna that's built on, on circuit boards. It's looking down at the primary dish and then uh, coupled directly to it right on the feed line is a set of low noise custom built amplifiers where, where we're really after uh, stability, noise, uh, and also cost because there's 2000 of these on the experiment. It goes through a set of coaxial cables. The band that we see the sky with is defined by a filter. We condition things a little bit before uh, uh, digitizing them in, in our receiver huts. Every element of this is built with commercial components, but custom assembled into custom uh, uh, circuit boards. Beyond that is a correlator system that uh, Fourier transforms the uh, data as it comes in, and then it does a massive networking operation through a custom network that uh, partitions uh, that adds up uh, uh, the data from each feed in a way that essentially allows us to run one experiment for each frequency and pipe each one of those experiments to a separate uh, a GPU. I want to hi highlight the work of Juan Mena, who, who was a PhD student at, at, at at McGill uh, working on this correlator and other aspects of CHIME and is now a postdoc uh, working on our, our, our VLDI and, uh, and other aspects of, of CHIME at MIT. Um, the correlator itself is based on, on, on GPUs. We assemble them in, in, in custom uh, um, in, in, in custom chases and uh, assemble them in a shipping container and then water cool each, each one of them. The GPU is the heart of our, our backends. We have our cosmology backend, which I'm, I'm describing and using here. Uh, with this, we have a 10 second cadence and we store more than 200 terabytes per day. We also have a pulsar backend and a fast radio burst backend. And I'll just take a moment to remind people that one of the joys of working at this wavelength, at this frequency, is that there's a lot of science we can go after. The communities that use data from Chime is enormous. Uh, one of the exciting ones is FRB's fast radio burst. In, in, uh, um, in, in the field before Chime turned on and released its first catalog, the number of known fast radio bursts was countable on maybe your hands and fingers and a, uh, a couple other places. Um, after the first first release of data from Chime, uh, the number of known fast radio bursts was increased by more than an order of magnitude, and we have uh, new catalogs coming soon. So there's a lot going on with an experiment uh, like this. And not all of the cosmology is in 21 centimeter. There's a lot of cosmology that can be done with fast radio fields as well. Finally, I've shown you widgets and uh, hardware, but really, really what's going on here is people with ideas that put the telescopes together. And the vast majority of ideas, the vast ma majority of designs that went into Chime uh, are, are coming from graduate students and postdocs that, spent, that have spent their careers to date uh, um, designing and realizing those ideas. Okay, this is the sky from Chime. This is just one night and you see the key features. Uh, it acts like a flatbed scanner and one column of, of this map comes through each moment and throughout the course of a sidereal day, we map out the entire sky. There's bright things out there, of course, radio sources like CASE and SIGE that it produce a tremendously uh, uh, bright signal and we also see in our near and far side lobes. The sun is up here. The sun is a pain because it's bright and it's not very interesting in most cases, but it's actually one of the prime ways that we map out our beams. And you see one of the other challenges. This map is at 670 megahertz. So our feed line is not sampled uh, uh, often enough to, uh, to Nyquist uh, uh, sample the signal and we end up with an alias signal as well. This is a, a, a raw map. I haven't applied any beam or anything else to it. And so it represents the raw data that we see each night. Um, I've, uh, th th that map has been taken here. It's been clipped and superimposed on, on top of it is uh, um, the, the catalogs that we use in our cross correlation analysis to see 21, uh, 21 centimeter signal um, that, that uh, others have already seen, well, that others have seen the galaxies for on the night sky. Um, th this is from EBOS and uh, our, 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 our catalogs here in, include about 40,000 LRGs, about 100,000 quasars, and uh, about 60,000 ELGs. Uh, and, and so that these uh, ha hatched regions are the locations of these sources on, on the night sky. The first analysis that we're doing with Chime in, in terms of, of, of the 21 uh, centimeter emission then is one that is cheating in a way. We're taking the location of these known galaxies, we know that they emit 21 centimeter, and we're stacking our data on, on on these sources on the night sky. Let me show you how that works using uh, um, uh, a, a figure from 
Mateus, one of the graduate students at, at UBC that has uh, contributed so much to this analysis. For each of the quasars that's known on the sky or each galaxy, we take the location of, of that quasar and we take just that pixel in our maps. We then look up the redshift in the catalog and choose the frequency with chime that corresponds to that redshift and, 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 and we place that inside our stack. So in this stack on the bottom, we have frequency on the x-axis, the location, the, the frequency that co corresponds to the quasar is the one that, that we populate with that pixel. And we go and repeat that many tens of thousands of times for each source on, on the night sky. In order to do this and to do it successfully to bring the signal, we have to have a tremendously good map of how Chime sees the sky, what its uh, uh, beam looks like. This isn't because it matters at all for seeing this signal. It really matters for our foregrounds and, and especially for bright point sources on, on the sky. So here I'm going to highlight the, the work of Dallas Wolf and, and, and many others that have contributed to the paper that uh, uh, um, puts together the techniques of measuring beams on the sky with the sun. The sun is annoying as hell, as I pointed out, but it's the only astrophysical source that rises and sets on the night sky once per year. It moves across our, our telescope's primary beam from north to south. And so we can stitch together the measurements that we make with other bright, bright point sources, everything else that just moves east to west. Uh, uh, across our telescope beam. And the story of, of, of the beam for any cylindrical uh, telescope is quite complicated. In this pattern, uh, in this case, the, the elevation azimuth axis, the X and Y axis can end up being fairly complicated. Uh, in the inset here, I'm showing the frequency axis as well. And you can see how challenging that could be for, for measuring the baryon acoustic oscillations, because as we look down along the line of sight, for, for any source uh, or for uh, the 21 centimeter signal, there's a lot of ripple along that line of sight. And that ripple can take a very smooth emission and turn it into something that can look like a BAO. The other way that we measure our beams is we take many known uh, upright sources. Um, this is work by Saurabh Singh, who's, who's gonna be talking, I think on day four about other projects he's he's contributed work uh, to Sorab Singh and, and and many others, including Seth Siegel uh, and Gary Hinshaw, on uh, uh, taking the um, emission from bright sources as a function of frequency, and the different frequencies are are shown in in a cartoon that's cycling through here, and then using it to define an analytical uh, beam as as a function of elevation. And, and this beam just has to be uh, well known to, to, to get out the 21 centimeter signal. We're currently at the level of measuring our beam at about the 5% level, and we need to get an order of magnitude better than that for the autocorrelation. So this is what you see if, if you look at, at the night sky and stack things up. Uh, the top left is our data. We've taken each, each uh, quasar in this case, we've put it at, at the center of the map. We've chosen the frequency that corresponds to the redshift of the quasar. And then we've stacked uh, many tens of thousands of these objects together. And we see a booming bright signal that we can measure and fit. That best model fit is shown in the top center and the residual when you subtract away the fit is shown on the right, which is completely consistent with what we see in terms of simulated Gaussian, uh, in terms of Gaussian noise, actual data and jackknife, and taking that same catalog, randomizing the locations so that we're actually stacking on locations that don't necessarily have galaxies and adding them up. We have a booming bright signal. And uh, one of the exciting talks that I'm looking forward to is Seth Siegel's talk on day four, where he's going to take us through the details of doing this analysis, the foregrounds, and the implications in terms of, of science. But suffice it to say that we have a strong signal when, when we take a catalog that's, that's uh, uh, centered at, at redshift 0.8. 0.9 and 1.2. In, in, uh, in, in all cases here, we have signal to noise well above five and going as high as 13. What this measures is not the cosmology of scales on the sky. What this measures essentially is how much hydrogen there is in locations where there are galaxies that are bright enough to be individually detected at the redshifts that it's easy to detect those galaxies. So it certainly isn't the raison d'etre for building an experiment like Chime, because it's telling us about the uh, astrophysics of these sources, nonlinearities, and so forth, and not about the scale of the universe. Uh, however, it's a first step towards that other measurement. Some of the things it does tell us about is the, the amount of uh, hydrogen in the universe, the bias, that is how, uh, how, how that hydrogen is distributed with respect to sources. And then things like the nonlinearities, how uh, um, the regions around galaxies 
uh, have nonlinear effects feedback that sources uh, where, where the hydrogen sits. And, and Seth will tell you more about that on day four. The way we've gotten at this measurement though, is that we've filtered out many of the scales that are of the greatest interest uh, uh, to us. Um, so uh, the, the scales that we're using in this analysis that we haven't been taken away are in the boxes. Um, the 800 megahertz scales are here in uh, orange um, and the baryon acoustic oscillations are these lines down here. So we're really uh, uh, taking a shortcut to get towards this signal because these, these particular sources can be a uh, very small angular scale. And we have a lot of work to do to get our beam and instrument characterization at the level that lets us see the BAO scale. Okay, let's move on to the near term future and talk about the uh, a next next generation of experiments that's going into the DRO, the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector. This experiment is going, going to be co-located with CHIME. It's going to sit right beside it. Uh, it's 512 six meter dishes, so very similar uh, in dish size to the Hyrax experiment that Devin's going to tell you about next, um, and a collecting area that's uh, um, uh, quite a bit larger than CHIME. We also have outriggers, that is arrays of 64 dishes that sit at Hat Creek and um, uh, the, the Green Bank observatories, uh, primarily for fast radio transient science. The building blocks for this are precision dishes, a technology that uh, the DRAO has been uh, pioneering for the last 15 years or so, um, the, a, a very wide band feed so we can get after much larger ranges of redshift. And then really the key building block is the team that we've built up putting together Chime, the expertise we have, so that we think we can put together an instrument considerably faster and uh, 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 handling systematics in a, a better way than Chime has so far. Uh, two minutes, Matt. Great. The, fun, the science that, that we're going after is uh, 21 centimeter, the distribution of matter in the universe. One of the other things we can get at that isn't accessible to many other uh, 21 centimeter instruments is unresolved H1 galaxies, individually pinpointing where galaxies are and taking the state of the art today and increasing it by more than an order of magnitude. So that we'll have a uh, catalog of 10 million uh, known H1 galaxies. Um, in addition to that, we can uh, uh, do fundamental tests of gravity with, with pulsars and the fast radio transient uh, science is, is uh, uh, foreground in, in the development of CORD as well. Uh, the experiment is, is also meant to be more general purpose and serve larger uh, communities. So we've included in our funding request the ability to serve more data and, up, uh, and uh, uh, do that in a standardized way to benefit more, more communities. Um, this is an artist's conception of what uh, cord will look like, the 500 dishes uh, here in, in the center sitting next to uh, the CHIME experiment. Um, the the one, one key thing that Ian Hendrickson is going to tell us about more on day two is uh, our, our prototyping right now. One of the great things about doing dishes is that we can afford, even before our, our funding rolls in, to build a few of these dishes, get them on the sky, and characterize them with great precision. Our dishes are accurate to um, uh, better than one part in 500 wavelengths, and so when we point these up at the sky, we first of all get a beam that's clear and clean, but much more importantly, we get a beam that's uh, consistent amongst uh, many dishes. I have about two more, uh, three more slides. Is that okay, or should I? Would you like me to? Uh, you're at time, but uh, if you can go quickly, we'll, we'll eat into questions slightly. Great. Uh, the other important aspect is the wideband feed. We're starting at 300 megahertz, so going out a little further in redshift and going all the way to the present universe, uh, such, that we're, that, such that we measure uh, a frequency of 1500, uh, 1500 megahertz. So three times the bandwidth of chime, two times the collecting area, three times the bandwidth, and a noise factor, uh, a noise temperature on the sky that's expected to be about root two, of, uh, one over root two of, of the chime noise temp temperature. If you multiply those things together, you have a figure of merit that's about 10 times, uh, uh, 10 times improvement. The, the timeline, uh, we received uh, word that we were funded uh, last year and we expect to receive that first funding this year. We're breaking uh, ground this year and we expect to have a 64 element uh, a pathfinder array on, on the sky towards the end of 2023 or early 2024 in the full experiment operating in 2025. Great, I will stop there and leave the conclusions visible and then let's move to questions. Uh, thanks so much, Matt. So there is a place in Slack in the uh, the 21 centimeter 2022 1A room. 
Uh, and if you want to reply to Peter, uh, Peter's thread about the different talks, I'm going to just throw in as, a, as the host prerogative my first question. Uh, oh, Peter just put in a question. So let's go with him first. Uh, so what is required to increase the accuracy of the V model for the autocorrelation measurement from 5% to 0.5%? A better EM model of the beam, deeper source catalog? Yeah, it's, it's going to take place primarily through more measurements of the sky. The simulation itself, we just can't, can't get the accuracy in. We need to know things like where outbuildings are, uh, reflections off those, the reflections uh, between cylinders and so forth. And that's beyond what, what a reasonable computer not even a reasonable computer, but an enormous uh, computer could do with something like CST. So, so the model itself involves uh, a lot more point sources on, on the sky, tracing them through and doing a joint fit of them. Uh, that is going to be challenging in the north-south direction where we primarily use the sun, but that mode is not essential, right? We're able to uh, um, tell, uh, tell our analysis which modes are well-known and which modes aren't well-known. One of the things that hasn't been uh, explored in great detail historically in the papers that outline how to do this is upweighting and downweighting your data, essentially telling your data not just what your beam is, but informing uh, your analysis about where you know the beam well and where you don't know the beam well in terms of angular scales, but also in terms of KX and KY moves. And so it's really an analysis uh, a project so far. Are we going to get to 0.1%? That is not a given. We will see. We're going to do much better than 5%. Uh, so the next question is mine. Uh, I'm, this is, this is a, a really exciting result to see and to read through this paper um, and a real landmark for the field. So I'm curious about what are the main challenges remaining as you see it for an autocorrelation analysis? So how... How close are you now if you don't cut out those short baselines from, in terms of dynamic range from a fiducial signal? And how, what do you think are the main remaining obstacles? Yeah. yeah. So this is going to be the case throughout the field entirely. The problem is not noise. The problem is not sensitivity. No problem at all. We have data in the can to, to measure the BAO already with the sensitivity we need. It's all about uh, the beam. Um, and uh, our ability to both characterize the beam and understand the variations in the beam. I'm not saying that we need to know how the beam fluctuates as a, as a function of the year, but we, we certainly need to know which modes are fluctuating and so forth. So right now, the challenge is in, entirely in understanding the beam. The other important thing here is that we've excluded all of the correlations, uh, all, all of the baselines that are within a cylinder. So we've taken feed A that's in cylinder A and cross-correlated it with every feed in every other cylinder, but never with a feed in the same cylinder. Operating within the cylinder is a challenging thing because uh, each, each feed, each amplifier is producing noise and at some extent radiating some of that noise uh, throughout the cylinder. There's also many bounces of the light throughout the cylinder. The scales that we need for the BAO on the sky in autocorrelation are... Um, are uh, you, we have to we have to be able to use the intracylinder baselines, and that's going to be a challenge beyond just just knowing the beam, but also knowing every uh, different uh, way that light can bounce through the cylinder and that noise can be emitted and reabsorbed. Great. So we are at time. Um, if there are more questions for Matt, or uh, hopefully there are more questions for Matt, please put them in that Slack thread. Um, and I believe now we have what's supposed to be a 10 minute break, but I would take uh, the initiative and say, let's make it a seven minute break so we can get back on schedule and meet back at a quarter till. See you all soon. Great, thank you. Thank you.
So Devin, we'll get started in a minute. If you want to go ahead and share okay. your screen. Yeah, let me do that. All right, can you see that okay? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. So you'll have 12 minutes and I will give you a warning at 10. Okay, perfect. Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's continue now with Devin Crichton from Zurich, who's gonna be giving us uh, an update from Hyrax. Yeah, um, thanks for um, accepting my talk. Um, so yeah, like, um, uh, like Josh said, my name is Devin Crichton. I'm a postdoc at ETH Zurich, um, and I work within the Hyrax collaboration, uh, and I'm gonna be giving a bit of a Hyrax update today. Um, the title of my talk is Status and Systematics. It's probably gonna be more of the former than the latter. Okay, cool. Uh, so what is Hyrax? Uh, so Hyrax is the Hydrogen Intensity and Real-Time Analysis Experiment. Um, it's a compact radio interferometer array designed with a redundant layout. Um, it's currently funded up to an initial 256 element deployment, um, and it's gonna comprise six meter diameter dishes, which will be operated, uh, instrumented operate uh, between 400 and 800 megahertz, so matching the charm band. Um, and then there are plans to extend this to a 1024 element array, um, as well subject to uh, funding considerations. Um, so in terms of location, Hyrax uh, will be co-located uh, with the SKA and Meerkat in the Stereo site in the Crew Desert of South Africa uh, with Hera, Hera as well, uh, which gives a, a really pristine low RFI site in these frequencies um, and access to surveys of the Southern sky. So the Cosmological Survey for Hyrax aims to survey around a third of the sky over a nominal four-year period. And the primary goals are going to be to observationally probe the evolution of dark energy through neutral hydrogen intensity mapping, as well as survey um, the transient radio sky. Uh, so thanks to Matt for giving a great introduction to um, uh, doing cosmology, post ionization cosmology with 21 centimeter intensity mapping experiments. Um, I'm just going to uh, present roughly what we've worked out to be the statistical power of, um, of Hyrax through a, through a Fisher analysis. So obviously, this assumes a very careful control of systematics. Uh, but you can see with a survey such as this, um, uh, there is at least the potential to put very tight constraints on the 21 centimeter, the BAO feature of the 21 centimeter power spectrum, um, and through that probe distant measures. Um, and you can then infer cosmological parameters such as the equation of state parameters of dark energy um, here as well. Um, so uh, we've uh, this is the result of a Fisher analysis, but we're actually also working on a, an upcoming uh, forecasting analysis. Um, that will um, use a more robust model of the instrument system, uh, um, sorry, sensitivity uh, that's gone through a more uh, sophisticated simulation pro uh, process. Okay, um, so additional, additionally, from a cosmological perspective, uh, we also aim to do a number of cross correlation studies uh, with Hyrax. So we have a significant overlap with uh, a number of different surveys um, uh, um, in the southern sky. So these include things like DES, um, Rubin LSST. Um, Hubs Pram, Cam Kids, DESI, uh, as well as surveys from upcoming satellite missions, such as Euclid or the Roman Space Telescope. Um, one thing that uh, some members of our group have been working on that I also think is particularly interesting um, is looking at cross correlations with CMB lensing. So this is something that our southern location enables us to do since we have um, strong overlap with high resolution ground-based CMB experiments, such as the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, the South Pole Telescope, and the Simons Observatory. Uh, one uh, note about this cross kind of cross correlation analysis, though, is that nominally the CMB lensing um, is coming mostly from long wavelength line of sight modes, which you generally tend to lose in 21 centimeter cosmology due to foreground filtering and, and uh, such effects. Um, so you have to do something a bit more complicated, like a, a cross bias spectrum. Uh, but we have a student who's uh, Warren Naidu, who's shown that you can actually do potentially really interesting measurement with this, so high signal to noise. A measurement of this cross bias spectrum, um, and there's some interesting parameter degeneracies um, uh, that this allows me to break as well. Okay, um, so apart from the, um, uh, the, the BAO cosmology and cross correlations, there are also additional science goals of Hyrax. 
Um, so we'll be capable of performing um, a, a really competitive fast radio burst survey. And we also have some plans to uh, develop outrigger sites throughout Southern Africa um, to help in uh, localization of, of fast radio bursts. Um, uh, one of these sites is actually progressing quite well. We could potentially have some site development happening in, in Botswana um, uh, this year at Bust. Um, and that allows us essentially to constrain the location of fast radio bursts to something that's, uh, you know, a number of galaxies in a field to potentially like the location within a, a given galaxy. Additionally, on the transient side, uh, we aim to do pulsar timing and detection um, uh, analyses in H1 Absorber Survey, and uh, we'll be, um, uh, the data will enable us to do galactic science as well. Okay, uh, so just a, a brief overview of the instruments. So this is what Hyrax looks like from our perspective. We've got um, the gold 1024 um, uh, elements, which are uh, fed by a dual polarization cloverleaf feed. Uh, the data is then transmitted over a custom radio frequency over fiber network into an ice-based um, F engine with digitized moon channelizer, uh, and then um, with uh, um, network corner turn into a GPU um, uh, X engine. And this is, um, yeah, a relatively, uh, a very, very high um, uh, data rate. So the incoming data is, is massive, even post-correlator. So if you're not stacking these visibilities and redundant baselines, uh, this is quite a significant challenge, um, a challenging amount of data to handle. Um, so one of the things that uh, is pretty far along with Hyrax is the correlator. So this is something we've um, built here at ETH. Um, so uh, Thierry Biant, uh, with help from uh, Andre Renard and uh, Keith Van Lindia and others uh, who are involved in the uh, um, CODACAN pipeline um, have helped develop the system. Um, and we've come up with this very dense uh, and powerful correlator. So essentially, for well, Hyrax 256, um, we've got this eight node system. Uh, each node contains two GPUs, four extremely fast network cards. Um, and the performance of this looks extremely promising. So these are preliminary numbers um, and we actually hope they'll get slightly better, but they're showing at uh, handling 200 gigabits per second per node, um, the utilization of the GPUs for N squared kernels is, is quite low. So there's a lot of room for beam forming and other things. Um, cool. Uh, so in terms of uh, other activities that I'm going with Hyrax, there are a lot of um, uh, prototyping or system characterization efforts undergoing. So we actually have quite a number of prototype sites. Um, so we've got this site in South Africa, the heart of the Esport uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory, where we've got some um, uh, uh, over-the-shelf dishes, as well as a prototype of a um, six-meter fiberglass dish that was made locally in South Africa. Um, at the Bayern Observatory here in Switzerland, we mostly use this very small two-element array um, site to prototype um, the correlator node just with some, some nominal on sky data. That's also allowed us to do things like beam holography. Um, we've also done drone beam mapping there, and we're actually particularly interested in comparing how well you can do with drones versus holography at, at that site. Um, and the Yale drone group has also done um, some stuff for Hyrax, as well as making measurements with a bunch of other instruments. Um, so they've looked at um, Hyrax feeds on um, dishes at the GVT with their drone system as well. Um, and then we're also involved with some of the prototyping efforts at the, the DRAO. Okay, um, so one thing that we've also been thinking about recently is um, if it's worth doing something a bit more complicated with our array layouts. Um, so uh, this is we're sort of at a decision point for this. So our nominal array layout is something like a standard grid here, which is highly redundant. Um, but also if you look at it in terms of UV coverage, um, kind of within the range, we're interested in making cosmological measurements of the EO feature. Um, there's a decent amount of gaps. And um, especially if you look at how your sensitivity to sky modes um, uh, goes functional frequency, um, the sampling is, is, is kind of irregular. Um, so we've been um, taking a look at doing some more advanced things. So this is one of the ideas, um, moving into this kind of hex tile layout where essentially you've got a much more complicated array layout, but what you've done is you've kind of filled in a lot of the gaps in your UV coverage, um, particularly on the short baselines. There are obviously many cons to this, so this is a significantly less redundant array, though it's not super terrible. It's about four times more unique baselines. Um, it's more complicated to construct, and we're looking at um, how, how exactly you would do that, and if you would be able to access all the dishes easily if it's a system like this. Um, uh, and it's also obviously significantly less compact than the standard array, out, uh, array layout. We're also looking at things like uh, cross-coupling effects, um, uh, how the array layouts affect those, uh, with some EM simulations and um, also seeing how uh, some of the systematic stuff that we're looking at 
uh, depends on the array layout here. Okay, how am I doing for time? I think I might be going quick. Uh, you've got three minutes. No, three yes, minutes. three minutes. Okay, that's what you want to bet. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so um, I actually don't have that much uh, that I was going to present on the systematic stuff, except to say that we've been um, we've had this quite um, sophisticated effort of trying to simulate our beams using electromagnetic simulations, um, specifically simulating the effects of um, moving things around in the in the dish feed system. Um, and by uh, looking at how that affects the primary beams, we've propagated this through um, our analysis pipeline and, and taken a look at um, uh, how that affects things like um, the, the relative systematic error that we see in our, in our power spectrum recovery. Um, and this is actually what's allowed us to set a bunch of these, um, uh, these requirements on our uh, um, telescope mechanical system, essentially um, target precisions for uh, various components um, uh, relative to each other. Um, and at the bottom left-hand plot here, I'm just showing, uh, this, is, this is what it looks like uh, for one of these example parameter sweep sims, where you take um, uh, the feed and you're shifting it around in the, the focal plane, and we're looking at the effect um, that that has on, the, um, on the, the primary beam response pattern, and specifically that um, as a function of, um, uh, of frequency and, and what kind of, um, uh, yeah, how that can affect our, our, uh, our science goals. Okay, um, and then finally, uh, sorry, I think I've got a bit quick. Um, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the status of Hyrax. Um, so kind of like I've presented here, uh, many elements of the, um, uh, the prototyping and the system itself are at, at relatively late stages. So for instance, the correlator is in a relatively late stage of development. Um, the RF front end and um, RF fiber systems um, will probably have a few more iterations, but they're relatively developed. Um, we're in the uh, design phase for the post-correlator on-site compute. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're testing many things such as um, uh, beam measurement techniques at the moment. Um, however, the main thing that's uh, sort of been li limiting us um, is uh, dish procurement. Um, so building the, the 206 dishes uh, for the initial deployment. Um, but we uh, believe we've got an okay handle on this now, but currently our schedule is uh, for prototype dishes at the final site. Um, sometime early 23, and then hopefully building out um, to the 26 element um, by late 24, early um, early 25. So actually similar time scale to, to, to call from what, what Matt had said. Um, and then we hope to build uh, continuously up to the 1024, although obviously um, that's kind of heavily dependent on, on um, uh, getting additional funding to build up the array post um, uh, 256. So yeah, thanks. Uh, that's what I had to uh, present today. Thanks, Devin. That was exactly perfectly timed. So well done. Uh, okay. Are there questions? I started regretting uh, cutting a slide or two. But yeah. Uh, uh, questions for Devin in the Slack. If people are also not confused about the Slack and want to post it somewhere else, I'll try my best to copy it over. Uh, otherwise, I will just post the question that I have, which is it's not seeing anyone else. Uh, I was wondering if you could say more about the setting of these specifications for dish parameters and what exactly you do to propagate through um, from those beam effects all the way to the power spectrum. What do you have to do about calibration, foregrounds, that kind of thing? Yeah, so that, that's something we're, we're kind of evolving significantly at the moment. Um, this is a, another slide I had on this, um, which kind of shows the end result of this. Um, I will say we're not really capturing calibration effects properly. So this is almost like um, assuming you had somehow managed to do calibration with these systematics present, uh, what is the kind of lingering effect of those systematics in your data? So it's actually a little bit strange. Um, but basically what we do is we, um, so we assume some kind of distribution on these say primary beam uh, parameters uh, throughout all the dishes or feeds in the array. Um, and we assume that's kind of uncorrected for and then we propagate that through directly to um, a, a perturbation to the visibilities. And then we try to extract a 2D power spectrum from those visibilities, assuming there's no such, um, uh, there was no such systematic present. Um, and this is sort of what you, what you get out of that. So these are actually pretty small scale simulations and it's a bit out of date, like I said. Um, but uh, what this is showing is the relative systematic contribution to the uh, power spectrum error over the systematic, so over the statistical, sorry. So anything that's yellow here is basically where systematics have started to dominate. 
Um, on the left-hand side is um, doing something like a, a, a pointing. Um, so say every single uh, uh, dish in your, your array has a, a pointing, a random pointing offset with a standard deviation of one arc minutes, three arc minutes, five arc minutes. This is how that looks. Um, and then this is if you perturb um, where your feed is along the focal axis randomly uh, with again different um, uh, different amplitudes up to up to ten millimeters uh, is where it starts getting bad uh, for that systematic. Um, so it's not a super sophisticated end-to-end -end systematics uh, simulation pipeline. We're kind of working on that. Um, I'm in particular working on. At, so we, we sort of go all the way from simulating these effects into power spectra, but looking at the intermediary stuff, like what does things look like in delay space? What kind of delay-based filtering does it imply you have to do? That kind of thing uh, needs to be evaluated. Um, and also the, the calibration uh, needs to be thought about it more carefully than what we're doing at the moment. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you, Devin. And if there are more questions, please don't uh, hesitate to put them in the Slack, uh, but we've got to move on. So our next okay. speaker uh, will be Sopa Ranchod from uh, MPI, who is going to be talking about work with Meerkat. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Shilpa Ranchad, and today I'm going to be talking on a deep meerkat search for for neutral hydrogen emission in and lens by dense environments. Um, so this work was actually done as part of my master's research at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, um, in collaboration with the Lens H1 group, whose names are listed here on the slide. I'm also so affiliated with uh, you know the University of the Witwatersrand and Sereo. Um, I've since moved on to do my PhD in something completely different um, at the Max Beck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Um, so yeah, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I'll just present um, on, on this work and also show a few of the other results from the collaboration. Um, so we know that there are large scientific gains uh, for understanding the H1 density across the universe, um, particularly its role in galaxy evolution and how it's related to star formation across cosmic time. Um, and there are many different methods that we can use to uh, measure um, H1 density. Um, of course, most relevant to this meeting is the 21 centimeter intensity mapping. Um, which can be used to measure the most distant um, H1 all the way from the epoch of reionization, and also to map the large scale structure of the, um, of the universe. Um, and then we also have Lyman alpha observations and H1 absorption studies, which, um, which can detect H1 at high redshifts around this region. Um, and then also H1 emission studies, which is directly detecting the 21 centimeter H1 emission line, um, which is extremely faint and is therefore quite limited to the lower range. Um, all, um, each of these methods have their advantages and all of them also have their limitations. So it is quite important to continually cross check these methods against each other um, and also just bring them together because they can be quite complementary um, in order to study the bigger picture. Um, for example, how large samples of direct H1 emission detections are quite important for H1 intensity mapping experiments. Um, so my work actually focuses on H1 emission, uh, which is limited um, with the highest uh, rate of detection at a rate of 0.38. Um, and even then it was a very um, high mass uh, source. So we do want to try and push these limits uh, with the next uh, generation and the pre-SKA era. Uh, next generation of radio interferometers and, and try and reach um, the cosmic um, uh, the cosmic noon at a rate shift of two. Um, and so there are a few methods that we can do this um, with, and the best prospect is probably um, H1 spectral stacking, uh, which is stacking the um, H1 spectra um, by appropriately shifting the spectra um, based on already known spectroscopic redshifts and co-adding the signal to increase the signal to noise. Um, and this method has already been highly successful in um, measuring the stacked H1 signal um, around redshift of one. 
Um, and then we have another um, approach, which is using the natural amplification of gravitational lensing, which will allow uh, direct detections of um, higher redshift H1 emission. Um, this is quite a novel approach um, and has not yet been successful, but I'll be talking a lot more about this approach um, today. Um, so the amplification of sources through gravitational lensing has been um, extremely effective in observing faint and distant sources across the electromagnetic spectrum, um, including continuum and spectral line radio emission. Um, CO, is, CO emission is a tracer for molecular hydrogen, and uh, lens CO has been readily observed around redshifts of 1.5, and even all the way to redshifts of 6 um, for very, very high mass um, sources. Um, it is quite linked um, to the star formation rate um, history of the universe, um, following um, the similar trajectory as is brought from the Madow and Dickinson review, um, increasing from the epoch of reionization and um, peaking at about a rate shift of two and then decreasing towards the present um, universe. Simulations show though that H1 and H2 cannot really be used as traces for each other, but they are still linked. Um, so by, absor by absor observing H1 at these higher rate shifts, we can then study the link between the evolution of H1 and the star formation um, history. This plot shows the H1 density as a function of redshift, where on the uh, lower redshift end, um, these results are from H1 stacking experiments. And on the high redshift end, uh, these results are from damped Lyman alpha systems. Um, so by readily detecting a gravitationally lensed H1 um, in this uh, redshift region, we can uh, bridge this gap and find out exactly what's happening um, at the point where star the star formation rate um, peaks. Um, we can also observe distant H1 in different environments, such as galaxy groups and galaxy clusters, which will help us answer questions about how the evolution um, of cosmic time differ over cosmic time differs uh, with different environments. Um, so successful uh, lens H1 detections will be the most uh, distant direct detections of H1 emission in galaxies um, and will also open up the parameter space to lower mass detections at cosmological distances. Um, and this is particularly suited to these radio observations because we want them to be unresolved as the unresolved detections will boost the flux to maximum and then maximize the detection rate. Um, there has been extensive simulation work done on this by our group. Uh, this result over here is from DNET-L 2015, um, where they used dark matter skeletons from the Millennium simulations to do uh, semi-analytical ray tracing of low impact parameter sources. Um, in this particular plot, they're looking at how magnif magnification changes as a function of frequency channel. And as you can see here, um, the lensed flux is much, much higher than the unlensed. Um, here is another result from this paper where we have, um, this, is, this GIF is also just um, going through the uh, frequency channels uh, for simulated H1 sources. This is at a much higher resolution, so comparable to the HST. Um, these sources are unlensed. And if you look at the same sources when they're lens, um, the frequency, the flux just shoots up. Um, and as I mentioned before, these sources do not have to be uh, resolved. If they were unresolved, it will boost the flux um, even more. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little background on Meerkat for those who are not familiar. Uh, Meerkat is a 64-ish interferometer located in the Northern Cape in South Africa. It was inaugurated in July 2018 and has had numerous excellent results since then. Um, the dishes have a diameter of 13.5 meters uh, with baselines ranging from 26 meters to eight kilometers. It is now operational in the UHF and L bands and the S band is currently um, undergoing commissioning. Um, it's got a really great sensitivity and an angular resolution of about 20 arc seconds. Um, and it will merge to become part of the SKA-1 mid um, sometime in the next 10 years. Um, so Meerkat is particularly suited for searches for gravitationally lensed H1. Um, firstly, because it is the most sensitive uh, radio interferometer in the pre-SKA era. And then in the UHF band, we should be able to reach H1 uh, redshifts of 1.45. 
Um, its angular resolution is also well matched to the predicted um, angular size of um, lensed um, emission, um, maximizing the probability. It's also got a very wide instantaneous bandwidth and a, wild a wide field of view, which will enable us, enable us to search larger frequency ranges and larger areas within one pointing. Um, this is an example, this, uh, this plot from Maddox uh, 2016 um, just shows two of the Meerkat large survey projects, Mighty in black and La Duma in red. And when including direct detections of lensed H1 emission, it expands the, the detection space um, to lower H1 masses and also higher redshifts. Galaxy clusters are particularly suited for lensed H1 searches because they are extremely um, effective gravitational lenses um, because of their uh, large angular size and very, very high mass. Um, and um, I think I want to talk about a few of them here. Um, so we looked at the Hubble Frontier Field Clusters. Um, these clusters, are there are six of them, and they were all um, observed with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, particularly for their strong lensing capabilities. Um, and you can see in this beautiful HST image from ABAR 370, um, there are quite a few um, lensed arcs that are, are visible without even zooming in. Um, so these are perfect because they fit um, into quite well within um, the, the pointing center uh, with Meerkat's large field of view. They also have a very well modeled uh, magnification maps um, and hundreds of available spectroscopic redshifts, which allows us to do um, accurate targeted searches for lens H1, as well as uh, quite accurately predict uh, the magnification. Um, so these clusters are um, between redshifts of 0.3 and 0.5, and four of them are in the equatorial southern sky and can be observed with Meerkat. Um, and then since we're pointing at these clusters, we can also do commensal um, science um, of the H1 in the clusters, which goes back to the um, scientific object uh, objective of um, measuring the H1 in dense environments. And because there are spectral, uh, spectroscopic redshifts available, we can do um, H1 spectral stacking. Um, so this plot here, it's, it's quite a lot, um, but it shows the predicted uh, integrated H1 flux for sources in the clusters in the top row and behind the clusters in the bottom row. Uh, this is just limited to the Meerkat L band. Um, the blue lines show the one, three and five sigma sensitivity limits. And in the bottom plot, the green shows the magnified flux and the gray is the intrinsic flux. Um, so as you can see, there are quite a few sources that are detectable above three sigma. Um, and then when we stack sources in the classes, that's, this will really um, increase the detection probability. Um, so our observations of ABAL 2744, ABAL S1063 and ABAL 370 were part of the Meerkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey. Um, for more information, you can see Knowles et al. 2021. Uh, they were done in the Meerkat L band and were part of the um, very early science um, Meerkat um, observations. Um, the data sets for this were huge, uh, four terabytes and up. Um, so the calibration and imaging was non-trivial um, and we used the Caracal and OSCAT pipelines to do this. Uh, thank you to our colleagues at Cereo. The resulting H1 cubes were about um, 800 megahertz in frequency range and um, 1000 by 1000 pixels. And we made separate cubes for the frequency range of the clusters and then also behind the clusters. And here are some of the continuum maps um, that resulted um, from the imaging. Um, the RMS is really low, uh, nine microjansky, three microjansky for ABAL S1063, and five microjansky for um, ABAL 370. Um, uh, we had the additional challenge of continuum subtraction because, I mean, seen here, there is quite a lot of diffuse um, extragalactic um, extended emission. Um, and these are, as I mentioned, were part of the early science verification stage of, of Meerkat. So these observations were only really about six to seven hours. And um, this low RMS can really be improved on with even longer integration times. Um, the H1 cubes had a result in sensitivity of two times 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses. Um, so we did a targeted and blind search uh, for H1 in the cluster cubes, um, and we didn't make any direct detections because 
the H1 mass detection limit was quite high, um, and then did H1 spectral stacking for all galaxies that had spectroscopic redshifts in each cluster. Two um, minutes. Two minutes. Okay, let me just skip through this. Um, then we found um, we didn't make any uh, stack detections um, in ABAR 2744 and ABAR um, 370, uh, but we found five sigma uh, mass limits of six times 10 to the nine solar masses. Um, and then um, the literature shows that you get a higher SNR uh, um, by stacking only blue galaxies. Um, and by stacking the five blue galaxies in ABAR 3, um, S1063, we did make a three sigma detection. Um, three sigma is still quite low. So we did an additional tests um, to see if this peak was um, not caused by the covariance of local image plane noise. Um, by uh, we stacked uh, randomly uh, random um, positions um, that had the same orientation as our target sources, and we did find that our peak was still much higher than the standard deviation of these random realizations. And then also to further test the veracity of the detection, um, we did a Bayesian parameter estimation. We used a boxcar function where the height of the boxcar was the H1 mass. Um, and sampled the posteriors with uniform priors using a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. We found an H1 mass of one times 10 to the 10 solar masses, which is quite a lot higher than predicted. Um, I'm just gonna skip through this in the interest of time. Um, and I'll go into more detail about why we think this mass was boosted. So four of the five blue galaxies are actually within 30 um, arc seconds, uh, which is 135 kiloparsecs um, at this redshift of 0 0.3. Um, so we think that this, the H1 signal was boosted due to source confusion between these sources. Um, as you see here, the spatial and velocity separation was below the modal separation um, of the rest of the uh, galaxies in the cluster. And because these four um, galaxies are quite close together and near the virial radius of the cluster, we think that it might be a recently in fallen group. Um, for more information on this, you can see Ranch Audit Al 2022. And then I'm quickly just gonna go through some of the um, lens H1 results. So from the Hubble Frontier field work, we didn't actually make any direct detections. Uh, we were of course limited to the L band, which goes up to a redshift of 0.5. Um, there's much larger potential for detection within the Meerkat UHF band, and it's also a lot more RFI clean. Um, here is just some work by uh, my colleague uh, Tariq Bletcher, who modeled the H1 disks um, of some of the um, highly magnified uh, sources in the Hubble Frontier field clusters. Now, this is for the Great Arc in ABAR 370, and this is just the um, source plane reconstruction um, of that same source. Um, these plots are similar to what I showed earlier, except Tariq went into a bit more detail about uh, modeling the magnification of each source. Um, as you can see, some of them really do have a very high magnified uh, flux density. Um, yeah, so just to end off, um, they are, we have some plans of targeting some other uh, known lens systems um, and also doing follow-up UHF observations of the clusters um, with already a proposal accepted uh, for Meerkat. Um, and these follow-up observations will also have much longer integration times where we really do hope to detect um, this lens H1 signal um, quite soon. And yeah, thank you. Um, I hope there is still time for questions. Yeah, we've still got about three minutes for questions. So if folks want to put their questions in the Slack, uh, I've got one, but I've also been asking too many questions. So. not seeing one. Uh, I, I was really curious looking at that movie you showed of the lens and unlensed sources toward the beginning. And I'm curious whether you can use, you know, you were saying that generally speaking, you don't have the spatial resolution to see that very complicated morphology, but just from the spectrum, because you're stepping through frequency, if I'm understanding this right. Yes. Can you learn anything about the morphology or kinematics of the of the lens source just from the spectrum? Um, well, with the Meerkat uh, 4K mode, I think the resolution, um, the spectral resolution is not high enough to, but if we were to look at it um, with Meerkat in the 32K mode, 
uh, yeah, you definitely should be able to get some sort of spatial, spa spectral resolution um, of these sources. Um, however, there is a much uh, higher chance of us detecting them if they are not uh, spatially resolved, as I mentioned before. I guess a follow-up to that would be what, if you had that spectral information, what could you learn about the original source? It seems like it's a, a complicated problem. Um, yeah, no, I mean, not really. I mean, we, we look for the characteristic uh, double horn spectra of the H1 emission, which will be able to tell us a bit about the rotation um, of the galaxy. Cool. Other questions? Well, if anyone has further questions, the, put a, go ahead and put them in Slack. Otherwise, I think we will move on. Um, our next speaker from Marseille is Wenkai Hu, uh, who will be talking about work with FAST. You're muted, Wenkai. You're still muted. There we go. Hey, hello. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Kai Hu. I'm a postdoc at the LAM. And uh, I'm very happy to share some results on the our results on the fast. Uh, topic today is extending the H1 story limit to the high red shift using the fast telescope. And the first telescope is the largest single dish telescope in the world. It has a illuminatory uh, the aperture about uh, 300 meters. And the sky cavity about minus plus 40 degrees from its thinnest angle. This gave the first uh, full sky coverage of, of about 20,000 square degrees. This table gave us the receivers relevant for the H1 observation. And for the most used one, the air band receivers we have beam uh, 19 beam and the, the noise of about 20 Kelvin. And in the future, we may update the receiver to the fifth array, and this will have the 81 beams, and this will make the fast H1 service much more efficiently. And here we make a forecast for the fast H1 service. We make, we simul we make the H1 sky from simulation, and then we convert this H1 sky with the fast beam. And then we have the, uh, this, this is plot showing the different feed, uh, showing the uh, of the uh, the each one sky each one sky observed by the faster in the different redshift, and then we we calculate we calculate the noise with the faster parameter and the field noise into the this sky, and then we get this noise field maps. Using the noise field maps, and they, we can we we make a sky, uh, we make a galaxy survey. You know, make in this noise field map with a threshold of five sigma, and we get the, and in the simulation we get the number density of the H1 galaxy detected in the in our noise field map, and from this we, we can see that with an integration time of about 48 seconds per beam, we can get we can obtain a number density of about 10 to minus four at the relative of 0.2. And if we use the integration time of, of about 400 seconds per beam, we will get the, the number density of the galaxy 10 to minus 4 at, a, at the relationship of, of 0 0.35. And using this information, we make a forecast for the project error of the, of the fast telescope. Here, we assume uh, the full sky coverage is about 20,000 square degrees, and the delta k over k is about 0 0.125. And this is, and we calculated the project error of the power spectrum estimated using the intensity mapping here and the galaxy survey here. And uh, we can see that at the low redshift here, the, the project error of the intensity mapping and the, pro the project error of the galaxy survey is similar. But when we come to the higher redshift, the, the, the intensity mapping will be much better than the galaxy survey. This is because the, the intensity mapping do not have to resolve the single galaxy. And, um, we, and from this, we can see at the BO, BAO scale, and for the, for the different integration time per beam, and for the galaxy surveys, 
we can the signal to noise ratio, the fast can the, using the fast, we can get a signal to noise ratio, get the uh, sigma of uh, five sigma at the red shape of 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, and 0 0.35. And for the unit mapping, the corresponding red shape will be 0 0.35, 0 0.45. 0 0.05 and 1.05. It means which means the fast using internet internet mapping, the fast telescope can mapping the light field structure to the intermediate redshift. And uh, in order to using the internet, internet mapping, we need to mapping the light field structure. We carry out several strip scan observations in the last few years, and using the airband receiver. We can, this is a frequent spectrum of one of the nine, one of our data. First of all, we're using this data to quantify the one of noise. The one of over of noise is the if a noise change with time, because it will introduce an physical structure in our data. So in order to, uh, in order to marry the true signals of the large scale structure, we have to quantify the one of noise first. So our method to quantify the one of noise is first we do the flagging, normalize the band path, and then using SVD, the singular value decomposition method to remove the sky variation. And then we fill the gap, the gap produced by the flagging, and finally we estimate the power spectrum. This is the power spectrum of the fast of the different be different beams and the different polarization polarization of the fast telescope. And this, is the, this and for the each sub panel, we're showing the power spectral of the one one for noise for the all mode, one mode remote, two mode remote until the thirty mode remote. We can see with more and more mode as we as we did the, with more and more as we do mode remote, the slope, the slope and the different the slope and the different physics area of the one for noise becomes smaller and smaller. After about 20 SVD modes removed, the knee, the knee frequency of the wire of noise will be about 1.8 times 10 to, 10 to minus 3 hertz. This means about uh, after 20 mode removed, about the, the wire of noise will be under the thermal noise for about 500 seconds. And uh, this plot is showing the two dimensions of the power spectrum of the two dimension power spectrum of the wire of noise. With just with different mode removed and the different polarization, we can see for the raw data here. We can see the one of noise is correlated along the spectroscopy uh, frequency. After, and after several mode removed, the the correlation is removed. And after twenty mode removed, we can see the one of noise can be constrained in the in this corner here. Finally, we constrain we. We quantify the what the wave, the impact of the wave noise on the twenty one centimeter power spectrum as measurement, and uh, we add the one one wave noise to the to the uh, twenty one centimeter from the simulation and measure the power, power spectrum. And the, this upper panel is showing the power spectrum of the twenty one centimeter and the noise plus the twenty one centimeter and the noise. And in the lower panel, we show the relative difference of this power spectrum. We found that for the one of noise, one of noise, we found that uh, uh, we found that for the one of noise with about thirty SVD mode removed, the power spectrum can be enlarged by ten percent, which means the power spectrum can not be ignored in our twenty one centimeter power spectrum measurement. And besides this, intensity mapping. I want to introduce another thing like to mirror the, the to mirror the H1 container in the high redshift. This is the H1 absorption. The H1 absorption is different with the intensity mapping because it is not a flux limited. It is the, the detectability of the H1 absorption is only only depends on the flux of the background source and the column density of the H1 gas. So and uh, this is it. Uh, so we search for the H1 absorption in the in the cross data of the fast. And in this plot, I show that in the, this plot, the orange and blue region and uh, blue regions show the shows the finished drift scan of the craft. And the orange region is the regions we use for the H1 absorption searching. We the, the this region this search the region is about three thousand square degrees. And in this searching, we we blindly we totally blindly search as H1 absorption. 
And because uh, the LFI and the and so we only the frequency 1.3 to 1.45 is searched. We search that each each one absorption in each in every single beam, and and because of we we do, and because of the RFI and the standing wave, we find many false detections. And in order to exclude this false detection, we cross match the information from different beams. Here in the right panel, I show you the 19 19 beams of the fast telescope. And uh, we can see if a true, if, if a signal is true signal, so this signal will uh, will be in the drift gun. The signal will be observed by the different beams along the scanning direction. But if a signal is a false signal, it will be maybe, for example the RFI. So it will maybe detected may be appears in the in any beam at at, at at any time point. And in the in this way, we verify our detection. And in the left panel, in the this spectrum, this this panel uh, is the spectral of the of the non H1 absorption system. And uh, we can this noise, this H1 absorption system is detected by the beam 10, beam 4, and beam 13 in our in our craft data. And also it is not detected by the other beam. So we can verify this is a true signal in our H1 absorption search. And using this way, we make the blind H1 absorption searching. And for our preliminary results, we found three known H observers and two new H observers. And these three plots are showing the three new, uh, with a three known H1 observers. And this is the, the H1, H1 absorption profile of the two new funding, funding H1 absorption. And this really shift is at the 0 0.6 and 0 0.09. And the black background source, background source is about 0 0.18 Yansky and 0 0.12 Yansky, which is not very bright. And uh, finally, we okay. And uh, finally, we estimated the 95 percent upper limit on the H1 column density frequency distribution for the faster for the faster H1 absorption search. And if we, we focus and the compare this with the, with the previous literature. And if we we forecast if we forecast forecast on these two, and as far as if we assume a full sky coverage for the craft, uh, each one of the searching and for the spin temperature of if we uh, if we assume a spin temperature of one thousand Kelvin, it will be this this distribution with will be like this this one, pink this pink one, and if we have the spin temperature of one one hundred Kelvin, it will be like this one. This shows that the, the, this showing the fast telescope can have very high sensitivity to the H1 absorption systems, and that we can use the H1 fast telescope to find many H1 absorptions in the near future. Okay, here comes to the end of my of my this of my talk, and we have we besides the topic besides the, the project that I showed about. And we also have very many ongoing and planned projects. And we are also doing many interesting, interesting things with the fast telescope. We are, we, we are map, we are making we are map, we are making the map of the 21 centimeter and the search the galactic survey in the real data. And we are we will also quantify the system performance of the fast telescope and stand, the standing wave, the one noise correction. And in the future, we will also search the each one absorption in the higher redshift uh, and uh, searching the each one absorption in the standing wave corrected and uh, the data after map making. And uh, we, we believe that uh, fast will have many interesting findings in the near future. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll give folks uh, a little minute to put their questions in Slack, but seeing none uh, so far, Again, feel free to post your questions before the, the talk is over, we'll get to them. Uh, I was curious if you could say a little bit more about your BAO forecast and what's assumed about the impact of, of foreground mitigation. Uh, uh, you like it, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we constrain, we constrain, we, uh, we calculate the project area of this, uh, of the purple, the posture spectrum of instant mapping, and also we use a Fisher matrix method to project uh, this error to the 
to the constraint on the dark matter parameter. I said with we, our parameter, I remember is 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 times 0 point, uh, like 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 for the for the parameter of the dark energy. Do you, do you have to make any assumptions about how much of the measurement you have to throw out due to foregrounds, or is this does it, are foregrounds included in here? Uh, foreground here, no, we don't consider the. Uh, we we are uh, we in the simulation and in my paper, I have show I have added the foreground uh, from the model into my simulation, and then we remove the foreground using the SVD math method, and we found, but in the simulation, we found the foreground can be removed. Uh, and so, do, and uh, this for the foreground, the foreground don't have much uh, influence on our, on our results. But uh, in the real data, it uh, it may, will be more much will be more complicated. Thank you. Other questions? Give people a few minutes to a few seconds to uh, any last questions. Otherwise. Let's uh, let's put our questions in Slack and thank Wen Kai again. So thank you so much, and uh, move on to Peter. So Peter Tibby from UW Madison will be talking about Tianlai. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for. <clears throat> what I consider the best Zoom pandemic meeting I've been to in the last two years. They're really well organized and a lot of fun. Um, also, I, um, I, um, I'm privileged to be able to go after previous speakers who laid the groundwork for a lot of what, um, what, the, what I want to talk about, uh, Matt, Devin, Shilpa, and Wen Kai. So, um, Tenlai Disarray has been uh, operating in Western China since uh, 2015. And so it's a radio quiet zone, uh, far Western China in uh, Xinjiang. Um, and it consists of both a cylinder array, a cylinder, so it's smaller scale than Chime, uh, but similar idea with uh, 96 feeds total. So 32 on each of the, these three cylinders. And then also a, a 16 dish uh, six meter uh, dish um, uh, dish array, which is, will be the main topic of today's talk. So, um, so yeah, radio quiet zone. Uh, the uh, let's see. So the digital electronics are all eight kilometers away, in a small town off to the the left of the screen. And uh, for both arrays, we've been using a a calibration noise source uh, that flashes on and off periodically to do phase calibration. So I point that out here. So, uh, so the site really has turned out to be quiet, radio quiet. And so uh, we can tune to operate over a, a broadband, uh, rather similar to um, chime band, uh, but going down to uh, redshift zero. Uh, so currently we're operating near redshift one where things are extremely quiet. And so you can see here a, um, some data from, from one visibility over a few minutes showing a flagging from RFI, which is, is actually taking up very little of this waterfall plot. And then you can see this, uh, the calibration noise source flashing on and off. So that gives you some sense of how things are operating. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've been observing with both the cylinder and the dish array for um, uh, you know, for many we have many months of uh, data that we're we're looking at, um, and we're planning, as I'll discuss in a few minutes, to retune to low redshift, so we can uh, so we we grab a hundred megahertz bandwidth at a time, and so we're going to retune to a, a bandwidth that puts us just above uh, redshift zero. So we can try to cross correlate with low redshift galaxy redshift surveys that I will show. So um, yeah, so back to the big picture, the, the goal of this, this the, the, both the cylinder and the dish array is uh, intensity mapping uh, in the post epoch of reionization uh, and to so understand uh, basically how the 
uh, how bo both of these kinds of instruments work and compare them to each other, particularly systematic effects. Um, and so we have the same kinds of systematics that, that Matt and um, that Devin mentioned early on, of course, very bright foregrounds, uh, calibration we've worked on. Uh, we've worked on beam patterns, simulations, and measurements with a drone. Uh, but I'm going to focus on one systematic, which um, was also mentioned. I think Matt brought this up, and that is uh, crosstalk or um, uh, correlated noise, we call it. And we think it's partially crosstalk, and it may be other things, which I will speculate about. Uh, the other thing is uh, surveys, future surveys. So um, I mentioned we'll, we will retune to low redshift to, um, for cross correlations, uh, both observing the North Celestial Pole, which is where we're looking now with the dish array. So we are able to uh, integrate there for a long time and uh, you know, integrate down the noise, uh, make maps and so forth. And then, um, this uh, the low redshift survey uh, may also include a, a strip at mid latitude. So we'll get to that in a minute. Just a little update on what things look like. So here, here's a series of waterfall plots over 11 nights from a particular baseline in the dish array. So in the vertical direction, we're going in frequency for each of these nights. And then uh, this is over uh, nighttime uh, hours at this site. Uh, so daytime, as Matt mentioned, the um, sun is very bright and everything looks extremely different. But here you're seeing um, a very stable operation uh, night to night. So the, these plots we sometimes call uh, ribbon candy plots, if you're familiar with that kind of um, cuisine. So the uh, what you're seeing is in colors is the, the phase of the is, uh, visibility. And then the, uh, the brightness is telling us about the, um, sort of the magnitude of the visibility. And so you can see things repeat uh, nicely night to night. And of course, we're very interested in how stable things are. Uh, most of the structure you see here, so this is observing the North, North Celestial Pole. Most of the structure is actually coming from a pickup in the side lobes of, well, not just far off the main beam, um, uh, from Cas A and Cygnus A, the bright, bright sources. There's also in here, of course, uh, you know, some structure coming from uh, some the, the weaker point sources that you find in the NCP region. So our beam is um, about five degrees across, and so that's that's the the patch that we're we're mapping. So if you combine those, um, those 11 nights, uh, you get a, uh, now a blown up version of that, that waterfall plot. Um, and um, below it is a simulation of what we expect. So this is our sky model uh, that includes just point sources. So it doesn't have the diffuse um, emission that uh, we know, of course, is there as well, uh, dominated, of course, by synchrotron foregrounds. Um, so, you know, these aren't exactly the same. And, and of course, we, there are lots of things we can learn by comparing them. One thing that's not included here that we know, or several things we know are not included. And one is we don't have um, our simulated beam pattern here, that is a, um, a full simulation from um, a full computer simulation of the beam. We spent a lot of time working on CST simulations. This is just an airy pattern uh, that we've used. So we know it differs from the real beam. And again, the, the source model is, is, is got some imperfections uh, scaling to the particular frequencies range here is, is not, um, is certainly not uh, exactly right. Okay, so what I didn't tell you is the first thing I wanna talk about, the systematic effect that we call correlated noise. And so what I'm showing here is a spectrum of a, essentially a DC signal uh, that we find uh, repeats night after night, uh, but with some fluctuations. So this is essentially we're subtracting out this. Um, this is an average 
uh, over the uh, the night of the um, uh, part of the visibility that's not being modulated. And so it you know, a couple of things you notice right away. First of all, um, it's not stable night to night. It's got rather similar characteristics in the spectrum, uh, but it's not stable. And secondly, it's big. So we're, we're talking 50, 100 millikelvin. And of course, the signal we're looking for is down at the sub millikelvin level. So this is a, this is a source of some concern and we're trying to understand it. So we know that there's some contribution here from crosstalk between the antennas. And so we've done electromagnetic simulations, um, and uh, you know, put those into a model where the system noise from one receiver is radiating out to all the others. And we can reproduce uh, the, the level here sort of at the 50% level. There's also, of course, a contribution from the sky itself. So unpolarized um, sky signals right at the North Celestial Pole uh, will be uh, stable with time, okay? Because we, we don't have any fringes right at the, there's no fringe rate right at the pole itself. And so we can simulate that. And that, that turns out also to be uh, subdominant to what we're seeing here. The third thing we think might be going into this is uh, just ground pickup and just side lobes of two dishes in a baseline pair that are overlapping some source on the ground. And so we're uh, this flat ground or the um, perhaps the structure and the hills um, <clears throat> surrounding the, uh, the dish array. So we're working on that, trying to understand those, um, this, uh, this particular systematic effect, which has to be controlled at a high level. Uh, two more One thing we've done is, is try to figure out how much better we would need to be with the coupling between antennas. And so this is some work done by a um, student at Wisconsin, John Potrowinski, of a feed uh, antenna that looks a lot like the um, cord feed and um, also somewhat similar to the Hera feed of a Vivaldi-style antenna, so meant to be very wide band. Uh, wider band than we need for for uh, Tenlai, and he's coupled it or optimized it for three different kinds of dishes. And so, in the current dish, the Tenlai dish, we're finding uh, this green curve, fairly high levels of uh, cross coupling using a CST uh, simulation. But if he puts it into a um, a deep dish, a high racks uh, or cord uh, deep dish style. Um, improves significantly on the cross coupling. Um, in the E plane, it's more than 20 dB. And then adding even a, um, a flared um, collar to the deep dish uh, helps even more. So that 100 millikelvin uh, uh, offset that we're seeing in the, in the uh, perhaps coming from cross correlation or, uh, sorry, cross coupling or from ground pickup. Uh, would be reduced sig significantly. But essentially what, what's going on is the far side lobes of these dishes are much lower than what we currently have with a dish array. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that systematic. So the other thing I wanna mention is a future survey at low redshift that we are um, simulating. And this would be of two types. One would be a few months spent looking at the North Pole as we have been doing uh, and simulating whether we can see individual galaxies, H1 sources, and it turns out we can without a lot of um, observing. And also a cr cross correlation with a, a, a galaxy redshift survey in that part of the sky. So very uh, things that uh, the latter is, um, a uh, topic that will come up later this week. And of course, Chime has um, uh, done well with cross-correlation. Uh, the other thing is looking at time, a, a so simulation can... of a mid-latitude strip that could cross-correlate with Sloan or even possibly with um, alfalfa. So let me describe that simulation process uh, really briefly. So uh, here's, a, here's a simulated patch at the North Celestial Pole 
So this is the um, this is the you know region we're looking at now, but we would retune to low redshift. So uh, this would be in the middle of the band, 1350 megahertz. And we would uh, do drift scans, um, both centered at the pole, but also at several different uh, declinations to try to map out this kind of a, a region. And we predict that in three months of observing with the dish array, we could, uh, this is what we would recover. So 16 dishes, you know, so we've got a fair number of baselines and we also have the the advantage that we're um, pretty good UV coverage of this particular spot in the sky. So we're recovering pretty well the, um, the foregrounds. And then uh, we do a um, very simple um, approach to foreground removal and just, uh, just essentially just remove smooth foregrounds. So not a very sophisticated approach. Uh, one that, that could work well if we don't have a significant structure in the transfer function of the system. But at least in the simulation, the, the foreground, the foreground simulation is um, fairly straightforward. And we find that if we use the H1 mass function from um, alfalfa, that we should be able to uh, detect a dozen or so um, um, radio sources of, or hydrogen H1 sources that are um, um, you know, just galaxies and they're H1. And uh, it's not a lot, but it's an, it will be enough to test the systematic effects in the instrument. So um, we're, we're looking forward to that. And again, that's a, a fairly short amount of observing to get that to happen. Peter, we're, think, we're over time now. So if we can wrap up quickly. Okay. So, okay, just about at the end. So the last, the last thing we want to do is, is cross-correlate with a galaxy redshift survey. Uh, North Celestial Pole is not a good place for surveys there. So there aren't any yet. There is a photometric survey that uh, we've been using to guide us in creating our own spectroscopic survey. And so uh, we now have um, collected about a thousand redshifts in that zone and we hope to be able to um, boost that. And so if we cross correlate at the NCP with that survey uh, with the uh, wind telescope at Kitt Peak, um, we get a um, significant detection of, um, of, uh, the, of um, cross correlation. So this is just one redshift bin at the, the lowest redshift bin. Uh, we also see things at a different redshift bin, uh, the next one out. And then, um, as I mentioned, uh, we are, we're also studying uh, cross-correlating with uh, the Sloan survey in a mid-latitude uh, um, uh, patch that uh, we could also look at. Okay, so I've talked about correlated noise and low redshift surveys, but I'll finish up here. This is the growing collaboration uh, in front of the telescope. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so we are over time. So if folks have to go, that is that is uh, totally all right. The next session is going to start in a little under forty minutes, where we're going to move to high redshift. Um, but if people want to stay, stick around, and have questions for Peter, uh, if you don't mind staying a little late, we can spend a few minutes uh, asking questions before we take a break. So there's room in the Slack, but I will put the question I had, uh, which was looking at your uh, the DC signal or the correlated noise. I was curious if you had looked at that in either delay space or fringe rate delay space. I know that's been really useful for us on Hera. I'm curious if you yep. see any clear features there or time scales or length scales that are meaningful. Yeah, yeah, really good question. Yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time uh, living in delay space uh, with this, as, as well as with the delay space uh, version of the electromagnetic simulations of the cross coupling. Um, all I can say is it's inconclusive. You know, we, 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 we expected to see something at the, this, you know, the baseline separation uh, time corresponding to that here, um, but it's, a, it's, it's unclear. And so, um, I, we, you know, we, there, there are many of these baselines to look at. So this one we've studied the most 
and um, haven't learned a lot from delay space. Uh, Cynthia put a question in the Q and A, and I'm going to copy paste it over to Slack, uh, which was, "What was the effective focal ratio with the deep dish, uh, the, the, the pizza style, uh, and plus color uh, extension?" Yeah. So, um, right. So the um, let's see. So the focal ratio that uh, Chen Lai has, and sort of a standard focal ratio for many. Um, traditional radio dishes is a 0.375 and and you know where the the feed is hanging out in the um, above the rim of the dish um, and so um, so we compared that to um, uh, FOD of 0.216 which I believe is fairly close to the deep dish uh, uh, high rack style may, may not be exactly right but the 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 um, because our feed is kind of extended, um, you know, it may be actually maybe deeper than uh, high rex because um, we wanted to get the whole feed below the, the edge. Thank you. So unless there are any further questions that I'm not seeing, I think we can uh, gavel this session to a close and come back in 35 minutes to hear about high redshift. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, thanks, everybody. thank you very much to all the speakers again, and thanks to Josh for chairing that session. Uh, just to remind everyone, if you haven't already signed up to the conference Slack channels, please do that uh, so if you can ask your questions there.
Hi. Hello. So we have a couple things to look through. No, it's um, <coughs> Ronnie. So do you wanna? Are you gonna play uh, Kelly's recorded talk then? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll send you the link. It's a YouTube video. And the only thing you have to do, um, are you on the Zoom app or on the browser? No, I'm on the, on the, on the app. I already have the, the talk open here for Kelly. Okay, perfect. Um, well, the only thing you have to do is that when you share your screen, um, you have a, a little, um, you, you have options at the bottom. You know, you choose what screen you're going to share, what app or whatever. Yeah. And then you have two tick boxes. And, the share and sound. so you need, um, no, actually, you need to, to tick optimize for video mm -hmm. clip. And it's going to, um, it's going to tick a share sound automatically. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. And, and that, that's it normally. After that, it works pretty, pretty normally. Oh, okay. I will never dance. <laughs> Thanks. So Ron is going to be sharing the session and uh, you speakers can try to share their screen if they want to give it a go. All right, I'll uh, give that a try here. Mm -hmm. And then, is that coming through? Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's beautiful. Uh, let's see if it works for me. Sure. This guy. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, looks like it's working. I guess you, yeah. you see it working, right? Yes. Yes. Great. Perfect. Thanks. So um, Ronnie as well, just for Kelly, uh, she she will answer questions on Slack eventually, maybe not live, but you can tell people that if they have questions, they can. Sure. So I can say, go, thanks. Has everyone had a chance to test their screen shares? Aaron and Jeff have, but are still missing a few of the speakers of this session. I'm monitoring the attendees list, but they haven't showed up yet.
Hello again. Morning. <clears throat> Do you want to try sharing your screen, Josh? Or? Sure. Looks good. Yep. It's working. Thanks. Slack channels, are we 1A or 1B? Well, 1B. 1B, thank you. Adelie, do you want to start recording the session again? Yeah, thanks. Hi, Barrett. Hi. Are we about ready to start? One minute to go. Great. Maybe we can start. <laughs> okay. I think you're good to start sharing your screen now. Okay, I'm happy to do that.
All right, we're at the 30 minutes, so uh, shall we go? Excellent. Great, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Oh, I'm just going to introduce you. Great. Welcome Please. back. Good afternoon at whatever time it is, wherever you may be. Uh, in the second session, we'll be going up to lower frequencies or higher redshifts. Um, before Aaron takes away with his talk, I encourage you all to ask your questions on the Zoom chat or on the relevant Slack channel, and do not hesitate to post them during the talk so we can optimally use question time. Uh, to set the scene, Aaron Parsons from UC Berkeley is going to give us a re uh, invite review on 21 centimeter observations at high riches. Take it away, Aaron. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about where we are with uh, 21 centimeter observations with Hera, a little bit in the context of, uh, of the broader EOR uh, scene here with 21 centimeter. Um, so uh, just to kind of get the lay of the land here, we are using frequency as we saw in the first session as a proxy for cosmic time here with the redshift of our signal. Um, as we go from the dark ages following uh, recombination uh, through to where the first galaxies form uh, over here. And then, um, and then we see, you know, we expect to see the gas temperature of the 21 centimeter of hydrogen with the uh, 21 centimeter spin temperature uh, decreasing as we get coupling with Lyman alpha photons to the kinetic temperature and the adiabatic cooling of the gas. We expect to see it driven into emission by the uh, X ray heating of the first stars and galaxies. Um, and then we eventually expect to see a patchy reionization where that gas is destroyed by the light of, uh, of our stars and galaxies. So uh, we aim to capture a decent portion of this history with Hera. Uh, we've upgraded the feeds of our initial Hera system now to these Vivaldi feeds that you see on the bottom right here. Uh, which have a frequency, a reasonable gain response between 50 and 250 megahertz um, as compared to the system that it replaced, which was mostly between 100 and 200 megahertz. And so this gives us access, hopefully, to the uh, first kind of absorption trough in the uh, uh, overall spin temperature uh, with, a, of course, some spatial fluctuations associated with those. And then also including the patchy reionization all the way to uh, to at by 250 megahertz, the hydrogen should be firmly in the galaxies at that point. Um, and we're not expecting necessarily to see that hydrogen uh, the way we are at the Redshift 3 uh, experiments, but, um, but we, we do want an air, uh, a band where we can expect to not see the patchy reionization signal. And of course, the uh, the spectral frequency and this uh, cosmic time is also a proxy for cosmic distance. So we're in the center of a large observable uh, bubble around us that we can observe with the hydrogen uh, line. And uh, there is, of course, a very rich cosmic history that we could uh, hope to access at a variety of redshifts. But we'll be focusing just on the uh, end of the kind of cosmic dawn uh, into the, the reionization. Um, but of course, uh, we have uh, things impeding our progress here, most notably the smooth spectrum synchrotron foregrounds of our own galaxy, which have uh, an, you know, an anisotropic uh, angular dependence, but in spectrally should be relatively smooth. So if we put that back onto our bubble of observing here, we should see uh, the anisotropies of the foregrounds as uh, you know, different distances around, different angles around us showing different uh, amounts of foregrounds, but the spectral axis, which for us is radial, should show uh, a relatively smooth variation. And that would be something that we could use to discriminate the foregrounds uh, that are out there from the patchy reionization signal that we'd like to, to get access to. Uh, unfortunately, our instrument is itself chromatic, as uh, I think many people appreciate. Um, and the farther separated our antennas are, the, the, the larger the, the U mode of the sky that they sample. Uh, so you could just read this uh, horizontal axis as, as uh, length between antennas. Uh, the more quickly they walk through different Fourier modes of the sky versus frequency. 
Um, and so if you want the least chromaticity in an array, you want you put your antennas uh, predominantly at the shortest uh, separation so that they don't move as quickly versus frequency. And therefore, your, uh, you can think of it as your, your fringe pattern uh, changes frequency less quickly um, and therefore allows you to keep smooth foreground smooth and, uh, and uh, discriminate the inherent uh, chromatis the inherent spectral structure of the sky. So if you take that to, I think it's a logical conclusion, you end up with a very centrally condensed array configuration like we've chosen for Hera here um, with antennas on a, on a packed, uh, fully filled aperture uh, in the center. Um, and we've even done a little fracture uh, courtesy of uh, Josh Dillon's uh, insight to uh, move some of the, the, the different sectors of our internal array uh, to dither them off of each other by about a third of a, of a sampling. And that um, just allows us to kind of make sure that we don't have any nulls and we can cover up uh, all the modes of the UV plane there. And then we have planned these outriggers that will be out around our central core that just allow us to enhance the imaging capability of Hera, primarily for identifying foregrounds and being able to uh, uh, localize things at better precision than what we need to, um, to, to do our EOR analysis. Um, so you end up with something that is a fully filled aperture out to uh, quite a ways in the UV plane here, um, which should make Hera, a decent imager, although it's designed primarily to do the, the central condensed core um, using the spectral axis to remove foregrounds. And so that's what we've gone ahead and, uh, and built out in the uh, Karoo Radio Observatory in South Africa. This is a picture before we've raised all our feeds. You can see some of the, the Vivaldi feeds out there. We've raised a lot more feeds since this picture was taken. Uh, and Google Earth has found us out there. Uh, you can see that we indeed have our fractured hexagon here as viewed uh, from, from a satellite photograph. Um, so uh, as you can see, we've really emphasized our, our, uh, our short baselines here. We have some, but they're likely to be not useful for, uh, for um, doing reionization. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, that that difference in chromaticity with, with antenna length uh, gives rise to um, what I think many here will be familiar with, the wedge shape of the characteristic wedge shape of foreground contamination in the, the three-dimensional case space that we are trying to measure the power spectrum of reionization in. So in this uh, three-dimensional space where we have uh, one K parallel axis and two perpendicular axes that read as Fourier transforms of the angular sky, uh, foregrounds inherently should be uh, isolated to a very thin band uh, in K parallel, which ref I, I guess you'd call it a, a, a plane in K parallel, where the foregrounds themselves do not vary very much with frequency. But because um, these differing angular scales going horizontally here correspond to baselines who have more inherent chromaticity, they're slopier in the UV plane, the uh, th this content this foreground uh, contamination gets bl bled out into higher k parallel modes as a function of that, um, and as a result, uh, we only are able to guarantee that uh, that smooth foregrounds don't occupy a rather narrow uh, area here in white, uh, which is the the area where we expect the foregrounds to be fully contained. Um, it, within, uh, within what we call the horizon wedge, uh, which would be the absolute maximum geometric delay at which a signal could come in from the horizon. And outside of that, uh, spectral structure can only land in here if there were inherent uh, spectral structure in the emission on the sky, or if your instrument put something there uh, through an amplifier or something like that. Um, and uh, if you look at it to scale, these, uh, th this wedge where you can recover reionization signals is, is actually pretty brutal um, in terms of what we can hope to recover from a three-dimensional image cube. Uh, ideally, we might uh, be able to see all the little patches of the reionization signal. But when you restrict yourself to only these signals that are uh, outside of the contamination wedge that our, our instrument imprints, 
you end up with something that is uh, it does not uh, really resemble very well the original uh, cube. It contains statistically the, the Fourier modes that you'd like, but whether you can turn that into a sensible image domain measurement um, it, it remains to be seen. If you could find a way to do better at removing the foregrounds, even if you can't get them all the way down to their intrinsic width, uh, you can recover more and more information. Um, and that might be something that we would like to hope to do. Maybe maybe not with Hera uh, uh, to its full effect, but to find out with Hera if we could find ways of working within the wedge to remove some of this foreground contamination um, and thereby enable maybe a next generation of reionization instruments that can do direct imaging of the twin one centimeter signal. Uh, so we have uh, a large team. We've worked really hard on our first season of observations. It's been published under Hera collaboration as first author. Um, sometimes it's listed as Abdurashidova uh, as well, uh, just alphabetically. Um, in our 2022 publication, we've got these upper limits in a couple different bands across the uh, our, our uh, spectrum. We choose specific bands because we have a fair bit of interference coming from terrestrial sources. And so we uh, avoid some of the most problematic bands when we were doing this. This first uh, season of results was done with our old system that only covered 100 to 200 megahertz. Uh, we picked several different fields in, uh, in sidereal time to correspond to uh, areas where foregrounds were not as bright. And we get uh, what are, I think are the leading uh, results um, uh, in uh, these bands for, for upper limits on, on the 21 centimeter signal. As you can see, a lot of these error bars include zero, but not all of them. And some of that is very likely coming from uh, systematic contamination that we need to continue to do uh, better in suppressing. And if we interpret these, I'm not going to go into the details of these models, but um, we can rule out some physically plausible scenarios for cosmic reionization, notably the ones where uh, you have a cold reionization, um, which is to say very little X-ray heating, we can mostly rule out and that uh, would come as a result of having a very large prefactor on the power spectrum that we, um, if you uh, had a, a very cold medium, uh, so you'd have strong absorption relative to the CMB, or you can get a bright signal by having a, uh, a very patchy reionization um, at the very largest scales. And that's another thing that we can kind of rule out. Um, so very broadly, the kinds of models that we're ruling out are ones where X-ray where early galaxies were, um, were not very X-ray luminous. We can rule that out. They have to be more luminous probably than the ones that we observe today. Um, but you know, I think most people will tell you that there's nothing here that is surprising or inconsistent with anything else that's been measured. Um, and this is just kind of a, a first pass at what Hera would be capable of doing. In terms of what we have to look forward with Hera, we uh, have um, some data sets that are uh, under under work here. So what what you were just looking at were the results of the legacy 100 to 200 megahertz system that was uh, put onto uh, Hera that it inherited from its its predecessor paper, um, and those results were were published with uh, 18 nights of uh, 59 antennas and. Uh, Josh Dillon is working hard and helping lead it, uh, our team on analyzing that same data set, but with 90 nights, uh, so substantially more, uh, more sensitivity there, um, and with some enhancements to the, the analysis. Uh, we also have been doing a couple seasons now of observing with our new Vivaldi system from 50 to 250 megahertz. Uh, we're still in the process of commissioning antennas in here, but we do have some data under our belt. Um, and Aaron Elowais is working on leading our teams uh, with uh, an, an analysis of, a, of a, about a 20 night data set with 40 to 50 uh, antennas. We have a lot more antennas than that now, um, and we are working on bringing them in. The, the tricky part is that you have to ensure that the antennas that you introduce are not adding systematics and are behaving very well. And, and that turns out to be a pretty substantial challenge, a high bar that not all of our antennas or not even half of our antennas are able to meet right now. But um, 
we're working on, on continuing to commission and improve our system. Unfortunately, COVID has made that harder than we anticipated. Um, and we are significantly behind schedule now because we weren't able to get onto site for a year and a half. Um, so we're just starting to return to, to site visits and, and, and doing that commissioning. Um, in terms of near-term upgrades, uh, so Hera, you know, things have to go hand in hand. We can't just throw more data, more antennas at the problem. We have to make sure that as we do it, we're, um, we're enhancing our analysis, we're doing better in sy systematic suppression and things like that. Um, which means that we're leaving, leaning increasingly heavily on validating our system and ensuring that the, the analysis steps that we take are uh, not in any way compromising our ability to recover the, the reanimation signal, that we've well quantified the degree to which we have lossy steps, if any, in our analysis and what the signal loss that can be expected in those is. So uh, we do a lot of modeling and validation and trying to uh, with increasing fidelity, model the full system with systematics and interference and all these other uh, aspects of our of our observing, and then to validate that we can actually get those those results. Um, we certainly can always improve the uh, the flagging of interference and of misperforming or poorly performing antennas in our system. Um, and we are always looking for ways to upgrade our our calibration so that we can. Uh, we can do better in, um, in characterizing our antennas, uh, both to, to understand if they're behaving themselves uh, and to uh, you know, put everything onto the same flux scale, same phase center and all that kind of stuff. Um, we are currently relying very heavily on redundant calibration. So that's the fact that uh, antennas that, um, that have the same separation in the UV plane should be able to measure the same 4A mode of the sky and return the same measurement. And uh, we can use that any different differences in that to solve for the gains of the individual antennas. We can't solve for everything. There are degeneracies that can't be solved for with those internal degrees of freedom. And for those, we then use sky models to fill in the degenerate modes. And we constrain ourselves to only rely on those sky models for the degenerate modes, which are basically the absolute flux scale and the absolute phase center of our observations. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're looking in the near term to upgrade our error analysis to make sure that we understand uh, the sources of error uh, and statistical deviation through, throughout our analysis, particularly in the power spectrum analysis going to our, uh, our limits. And then the null tests that allow us to understand whether the excesses that we might observe are systematics that are coming from calibration or misperforming antennas, or whether these are coming from, uh, you know, celestial uh, origins. Um, one of the, an ongoing issue that we're, we're working on addressing is coupling and crosstalk between elements of our array. Uh, it's well established that we see these, these couplings. Um, they show up uh, is as low fringe rate, which is to say time stable uh, excesses in cross correlations that we measure. Uh, but we have seen some evidence for some what's essentially leakage between visibilities that because you have um, a little bit of crosstalk between signals, you can have in a cross correlation between two antennas, both the visibility that represents that separation and uh, a coupling to another visibility. And so that actually gives you a mechanism by which you could address some of this by using uh, what would amount to an, a matrix inversion of the, um, the different visibilities. Um, we also have, uh, Aaron Eloise has introduced Dianu foreground filtering, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about. It's uh, using a, a discrete prolate spheroidal uh, basis um, for, using, for doing um, uh, filtering in uh, uh, for, of our smooth spectrum foregrounds. And it is particularly able to bridge uh, spotty sampling and gaps in sampling that we get from our sampling uh, from flagging interference. And it's able to bridge that quite effectively uh, with very minimal ringing or anything like that. Uh, further down down the road, you know, we'll be looking for ways that we can further improve our uh, our array. Whether we can uh, reduce the coupling between elements, whether we can actually invert that coupling, 
uh, whether we can cal a lot of our calibration right now is based on the assumption that our arrays response is smooth in in frequency as it was designed to be, but we uh, would like to open up the possibility that our array is not smooth and to use calibrations that are able to identify and correct for that unsmoothness. Um, we'll be continuing over the next couple of years to be uh, cleaning up and polishing our, our radio frequency system and our digital correlator. Um, we'll be moving before too long to baseline dependent averaging simply because the data volume coming out of HERA is too big to keep on disk for very long. So we'll, uh, we'll average different visibilities uh, by different amounts depending on how uh, long that, that um, baseline is. Um, and then we'll probably also be looking at some uh, some wall phase switching to handle some of the, the cross coupling uh, that might happen in some of our electronics. Um, so just to run kind of quickly through a couple things that uh, that I think others will talk about. Um, you know, as we get closer and closer to a detection with Hera, we're going to rely more and more heavily on validation to ensure that we um, are uh, modeling all the analysis steps that we put the data through on, on uh, simulations where we know what the answer is and to make sure that, uh, that not only have we uh, accurately represented what the, um, what the signal is, but we also are, are correctly inferring the error bars that we should be able to get from these. And there's a, a huge effort that's going into this. And so I just wanted to highlight um, in Aguirre et al. 2022, um, an overview of, of some of that validation, which we'll keep trying to upgrade for every uh, data release and every paper that we uh, put out for HERA. Three minutes left. Thank you. Um, we also have, uh, you know, this cross-coupling of systematics is an ongoing issue. There's a great paper that Nicola Fagnoni uh, wrote last year, 2021, that shows that if you, even if you put in a plane wave at Zenith into our array, you can watch it ringing around inside of our array, just bouncing off of uh, the metallic structures for a significant amount of time. And that introduces spectral structure in all of our antenna streams. Um, that is uh, that is problematic, and so um, you know we're looking to mitigate some of that coupling. Um, if we you know we're ex experimenting with things like uh, whether we can put um, some shrouding around dishes, we gave ourselves a little space between our dishes in case we needed it. Um, but it's really tricky putting in these shrouds easily makes things worse, not better. So uh, it takes a fair bit of work in order to make sure that um, that we don't uh, that we're actually improving the problem. We'll also be working hard on the uh, real-time calibration as we have to as we have less and less in time on disk that we can afford to keep data. We're going to be working hard on uh, getting our calibration in real time to a level that we can stack the data. Um, and this involves flagging interference, filling in interference uh, before we're binning data up. Um, and keeping track of, of what we filled in versus what was measured. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work here that we'll, we'll be working on. Um, a last thing that I wanted to particularly highlight was the, um, these discrete prolate spheroidal filters that, uh, that Aaron Eloweiss uh, introduced to the community, which I think has been of use already in chime analysis, it's certainly useful in HERA. It's a way of having an analytic uh, way of, of computing your basis functions in a space that is well contained within your, um, your, your spectral window. So it doesn't suffer the effects that usual Fourier filtering has of ringing off of the edges of your band, ringing off of gaps. Um, and it's able to filter these uh, quite amazingly. And, um, you know, so this is easy, uh, uh, a thing that you would wanna do on your, um, foreground contaminated visibilities to, to remove your bright foregrounds uh, while retaining the reionization signal. And then, um, you know, and then you've reduced your prefactor if you're trying to stack up data 
Um, you've reduced the, the prefactor on which you have to match your gains day to day, match your sampling day to day, um, all these sort of things. So, uh, so this filtering we use, we use or are planning to use um, in our real time system. But another, it also there there are significant other applications of of these filters which uh, we're exploring, and um, most notably uh, recently, Aaron published this uh, this. Uh, idea that we had had that you might be able to calibrate a uh, an array simply on the metric of trying to maximize the smoothness of the visibilities which is to say that you can describe you can write down the dianu filters that you'd like to uh, to be applying to your your visibilities and then you can tune your gains to maximize the um, or I guess to, to minimize the residuals of your visibilities outside of those filters. Um, and uh, by cutting some computational corners using um, some of the eigenmodes of the arrays and using a TensorFlow optimized uh, uh, optimization loop, um, was able to demonstrate that, that we can in fact uh, fully calibrate an array um, as well as redundant uh, calibration would be able to do um, using just these, uh, just this metric of trying to maximize the smoothness of the calibrated visibilities, which is an interesting path forward, um, and one that we might be able to use and and leverage using some other ideas that we've been uh, toying around here. I we're working currently on a paper. A student of mine, Tyler Cox, is writing that we'll be using spectral redundancy which is to say me measuring the same U and V modes at different frequencies using different baselines and using the fact that those should share information uh, on a sky that does not evolve quickly in frequency and use that in order to uh, get some really enhanced constraints on our spectral axis and how smooth our, our array is. So that's kind of an overview of where we're at and I think I'll leave it there. Well, thank you, Aaron. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them either on the Zoom chat or on the relevant Slack channel. And while you're all frantically typing away, I'll just open up the question time with my first question. So you mentioned sort of um, that you're, you've already been trying to switch over despite of COVID to the new feeds, and you're still trying to pull out things from the old data. What, what do you think will be really the major showstopper what you can do with the older feeds and how do you think, what is sort of then, uh, I guess the motivation to go to those newer feeds? Well, the, so, I mean, we've already gone to the, the new feeds. The old feeds were fairly reasonable. Um, they don't have the spectral coverage that we uh, ideally wanted, um, but for what they were designed to do, they were, they were pretty good. Their, the primary problem with them was that they were inherited from the paper system that preceded them. They were already about seven years old by the time we put them on Hera and just attrition of the electronics and the physical system was starting to really bear on us. So um, we had some number of, of elements that we were able to get up and working with those, but um, we used everything that was still working on those. And at that point we, we needed a new system and that's what we did. So, uh, so we have the new system coming in. It's looking pretty good, um, and you should be seeing results from it uh, before too long. Wow, that sounds very exciting. Um, let me just quickly check. I haven't seen anything on the Zoom chat, and there are also no questions so far on Slack. So with that, I'll just encourage everyone, if you're re-watching this talk, just post your questions on Slack and we're just going to go away with a slightly earlier break. Uh, thank you, Aaron, again for opening up the session and uh, looking forward to see you all at 15 minutes past the hour for wherever you are for the rest of the session. Great. My pleasure.
Hey, Nick, I don't think you've tested your screen sh um, sharing stuff yet. If you want to, you could still use the remaining time of this break to do so. Uh, sure thing. Let me do that really quick. <clears throat> How does that look? It's still, yeah, got it. Looks fine. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Are you fine with a three minute warning beforehand? Yep, that's all right. All right, we're at 15 minutes past the hour. So welcome back after that 15 minute break to continue our session on updates from experiments at lower frequencies. We are now gonna to listen to Barat Gelab from the Captain Institute at the University of Groningen, who's gonna to talk to us about 21 centimeter cosmology with low far, art far, and menu far. Take it away. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, so hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the 21 centimeter cosmology effort we are leading with the LOFAR and the associated projects ARTFAC and NENUFAR. Uh, so uh, let's begin. So to provide a bit of a context, uh, the why do we need to study the universe's first giga year? So uh, the measurements of the CMB uh, provides a snapshot of the moment when the universe was only around four. 400,000 years old. And it has been measured very well with experiments uh, used with the space probes using the uh, WMAP and Planck. And most of the cosmological um, uh, studies have been uh, mostly based on the CMB experiments. And on the other hand, we have the observations of the galaxies and galaxy clusters, ground based telescopes and space based telescopes that provide a picture of the astrophysical processes in the present day universe. However, we, there is a big uh, gap in the current understanding of the universe. Basically, how did the universe went from being cold, dark, and neutral to the current form of uh, warm and ionized? So what happened during the uh, cosmic dark ages or cosmic dawn and deionization? So these epochs are largely un unexplored, except for some rare detection of high redshift galaxies and quasars, et cetera. And they do, uh, observing these epochs will provide a wealth of information about various processes uh, in the early universe. So what experiments are going on to observing these uh, first billion years? So uh, these experiments are uh, using 21 centimeter signal, which is redshifted. Uh, and measuring this redshift to 21 centimeter signal as a function of redshift. So there are three ways to do it. You can do 21 centimeter tomography, which is basically directly imaging the neutral hydrogen from the high redshift. However, this is not currently possible uh, with the, given the sensitivity of the current experiment, maybe the upcoming SK or the uh, HERA phase two with the new feed may be able to do it. The second category is the global 21 centimeter experiments such as EDGES, SARAS-3, or WE. So these experiments uh, are trying to measure the sky average signal of the um, sky average 21 centimeter signal as a function of redshift. And then final category is the interferometric experiments that are aiming to measure the fluctuations in the brightness temperature of the 21 centimeter signal from epoch of cosmic dawn 
so these experiments are with uh, LOPAR, MWA, HERA, NANOPAR, and uh, Feature SK. So where do we currently stand with these experiments? So this plot here provides a summary of the all the upper limits that have been placed with different experiments. Although these upper limits have been, these experiments uh, have placed very impressive upper limits uh, and ever improving results. However, uh, the detection still remains elusive. And uh, you can see the uh, ranges that will be, that redshift ranges uh, that are probed by the LOPAR, NINUPAR, as well as the ARPAC project and the proposed uh, ARIES project. So before I dive deeper into these projects, let's talk about the scale of the problem. So the redshift of 21 centimeter signal that we want to measure from the cosmic dawn and epoch organization is extremely faint. It's order of a few millikelvin. This, uh, this signal is contaminated by foregrounds that are several orders of magnitude brighter, such as uh, galactic synchrotron radiation or extragalactic um, extra galactic sources such as galaxies, radio galaxies, or clusters, et cetera. Earth ionosphere itself uh, adds uh, additional uh, contamination. It basically distorts any incoming signal through the ionosphere and introduces random phase shifts. The radio frequency interference itself is a big problem, uh, which uh, introduces, uh, which, although it is narrow band in many cases, but it does introduce uh, spectral um, discontinuities that and ends up as a leakage uh, that ends up leaking the signal uh, from foreground signal from um, from large Fourier modes to small Fourier modes. And then we have in instrumental in imperfections such as um, mutual coupling between the different uh, antennas, uh, polarization leakage, cable reflections, or as well as uh, any digitization related issues. Finally, the data processing pipelines we use it uh, itself cause several contaminations, which 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 are basically imperfect calibration or um, over subtraction of foreground or um, yeah, mostly these and these uh, contamination have to be um, mitigated with a high accuracy in order to measure the signal. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go forward to the LOPAR epoch organization key science project. So the LOPAR UR team is actually leading various projects. One is the LOPAR high band uh, antenna uh, reionization project. So this project uses the high band antenna of the LOPAR telescope in the Netherlands uh, to measure the 21 centimeter signal from the uh, redshift range of seven to 11. We already have around 300,000 hours, 3,000 3, hours of data observed. Uh, and we have published results uh, in 2017, Patil et al. and Martens 2020. Uh, the uh, recent project we started was with ARTPAC. So this project aims to measure the 21 centimeter power spectrum at the uh, edges absorption trough. So we already have 500 hours in hand and we uh, reported first limits in 2020. And there is upcoming uh, project that we have proposed as a part of LOPAR 2.0. So this is this is uh, what we call as ARIES or ARTPAS Reionization Survey. This project will basically uh, aim towards mapping the diffuse emission uh, in the northern sky as well as uh, measuring 21 centimeter power spectrum with ARTPAC instrument, which is actually a tile level imager uh, complementary to the LOPAR high band uh, imager, which is uh, which use station uh, beamforming. Then we have NENUPAR. NENUPAR is uh, another experiment, uh, is a new telescope. It's a radio interferometer in, at NASA Observatory in France. So this is a low frequency instrument. Mostly uh, it will target the redshift range of 15 to 25 and um, the deep field observations are ongoing. So the target is to collect thousand hours of data for uh, further processing. Also, the LOPAR, project, uh, LOPAR UR team is heavily involved in the SKA project. So let's look at the current limit from LOPAR. So this, uh, these uh, results were published in 2020 uh, by Martin et al. So the deepest limit at uh, that shape of 9.1. So these were, uh, this power spectrum was measured using 140 hours of data. And this was actually uh, around a factor of 10 improvement from the Patil et al results. However, we do see uh, the 
final res Stokes I residuals or the uh, final residual power spectrum is still affected by excess power. So compared to the thermal noise, so this excess power need to be mitigated or uh, removed uh, in order to go further deep um, uh, for further deep integration. So let's talk about a bit more about this. So we investigated the origin of this excess power. Uh, so we looked at the night to night correlation of this excess power. We do see that the nights which are closer in time and closer in LST do see uh, uh, relatively uh, higher correlation compared to the nights which are farther in LST and farther in um, time point by, by when they were observed. So my colleague Yoyin Gan has recently published a paper investigating the cause of this issue. So since uh, this, the, and when we look at the, this excess vari variance as a, this excess power as a function of LST, we do see a moderate correlation. This can, uh, this, uh, this, this means that there might be something that is uh, related to um, that changes with LST. So we looked at the ionospheric diffractive scale and looked at the correlation between the excess power and the and and the the diffractive scale of ionosphere that is a metric uh, to uh, that is a metric about the which tells the ionospheric uh, kind of observe, observing conditions so we did not find any clear correlation uh, between the uh, the two for different lsts however we did see that there was some mild correlation um, uh, as function of lst and this uh, could tell us that there is some, uh, since there is a LST based correlation that uh, this access might be related to something in the sky. So uh, we looked at the, how the sky model power correlated with this. All, here also we did not see a strong correlation, but we then, uh, we suspect that it is uh, most uh, probably due to the residuals left over by subtraction of bright sources that are off axis from the field, such as gas and signal phase. So in order to mitigate this access, we have, uh, we are working on several improve improvements in the pipeline. So the first uh, improvement is to uh, improve the direction dependent calibration itself. So previously we were using a one uh, step direction depend independent calibration. Now we have split it into two. And then we have another improvement of direction dependent calibration. Uh, one Im additional improvement includes uh, using, uh, adding the diffuse emission in the sky model itself. There is another improvement, which is uh, enhanced co uh, foreground covariance in the GPR uh, to um, properly remove these foregrounds. And also uh, the excision of paint or broadband RFI. So let's look at some results from this. So in the two step direction in independent calibration, the first step is basically a high time resolution calibration, but using spectrally smooth gain. And then there is the additional bandpass calibration step, which, uh, which actually uh, uses long time intervals, but it, uh, it captures the time stable uh, bandpass response, which, is, uh, which does have a frequency structure. We do see some mild improvements in the top plot compared to the uh, previous uh, analysis. But uh, the improvement is not very big, but, we, uh, uh, but it is much more uh, resilient, resilient to the signal loss now. So we, do, we also improve the direction dependent calibration. So rather than using the solution that were enforced on a polynomial, we started, uh, we have uh, moved now to directly use these polynomial solutions uh, to subtract the bright sources. And we do see significant improvements here. So uh, you can see the, uh, the, the extra power around, around Cygnus A and Horizon have been uh, removed well, and as well as close to the second side lobe. So we are currently furthermore improving the models for CAS and Cygnus A, and also improving the sky model, especially the, for the clusters that are uh, far away from the main beam. Three minutes left, okay. Rob. Yeah. So mitigating the excess, um, we also we are also working on the sky model improvement. So for this, we are using the ARPAC HBA emitter to map the de degree scale diffuse emission around the NCP. 
So uh, this uh, paper is, uh, is in review. So we found that uh, the diffuse emission is very strong in the NCP, like order of uh, several tens of kelvins. And we use uh, clean components and shapelet models to um, model this uh, emission. And they do both, both of them do a pretty good job. So these improvements are already been included in, into the pipeline. Moving on to the next project, the Arctic Cosmic Explorer. So this project we started in the in 2018 uh, to measure the 21 centimeter power spectrum in the edge absorption scrub. And we have also planned a bunch of uh, improvements in the uh, our ACE pipeline. So which was fairly simple, just uh, do a flagging, then direction independent calibration, direction dependent calibration, a loop around flagging, and then foreground removal. So the new uh, improvements include a high resolution direction independent calibration, uh, improved primary beam model and the sky model, uh, more rigorous flagging strategy that basically gets rid of this additional uh, flagging loop, and then uh, interpolation of the flag samples, um, and then finally uh, enhanced foreground covariance. So these uh, are already uh, work in progress and stay tuned for the results. Uh, then the final project I'll talk about is the Nilufar Cosmic Dawn uh, Key Science project. So this is um, this project aims at measuring the 21 centimeter power spectrum from the cosmic dawn. So the instrument is located at NASA Observatory. It observes in 10 to 8, 8 megahertz band. It has 78 core station currently with 19 analog phased antenna each, and there are three remote stations which are around like one kilometers away. Uh, so we, there are still uh, 20 more additional core station funded and three more remote stations. So the phase one observation have been conclude, concluded, which were mostly RFI environment studies as well as systematic studies. Phase two deep observations are currently going on. Just a quick peek at the uh, results. So we do see nice correlation between uh, ARTFAG observations and the diffuse emission we see with NINUFAR. And there, uh, there were studies with uh, looking at the polarized intense polarized uh, emission in the field. We do see some polarized intensity, although at very low Faraday depths, which might possibly be um, polarization leakage. Uh, but we are looking further into that. And then the addition of this uh, new remote station actually have improved the resolution by almost a factor of three, uh, which uh, helps us in uh, calibrating uh, the instrument well as well as obtaining a deeper sky model. And finally, going uh, uh, forward from this point, we have recently proposed a new project called uh, ARTFAC Reanalysis Survey. So this project will aim at multi-tiered mapping of the diffuse structure in the northern sky and the 21 centimeter power spectrum measurements. So the first tier would be using uh, spherical harmonics or M-mode imaging with ARTFAC at dipole levels, and then a more deeper um, imaging of uh, small fields with uh, tile level imaging with ARTFAC and NINUFAR. And these two models will be combined uh, and also co the low and high band maps will be combined. This will complement the uh, new upcoming low far, uh, uh, low, low far uh, sky surveys. And finally, I will leave it here at the summary. So uh, low far uh, UR team has been involved in uh, several projects and we reported our, our deeper, deepest limit at Redshift 9.1 in 2020. So we all, uh, the ARTFA Cosmic Explorer aims at measuring the 21 power spectrum at Redshift of 18. And then uh, stay tuned for the upcoming NINUFAR Cosmic Dawn project results that aim to detect the 21 centimeter signal in the Cosmic Dawn Redshift. And a bunch of imp improvements have been planned and we are working on most of these improvements are in form of pipeline. So uh, to make sure that uh, we don't see any strong access in the residual power, as well as that that is, and the pipeline is more uh, resi uh, resilient to the signal loss. And the new art park realization survey will tackle the biggest problem of uh, uh, having biggest problem of uh, that the foreground maps are incomplete. So this, this will uh, aim, aim at providing more complete foreground maps of the northern sky, as well as 21 centimeter power spectrum measurements from epoch of realization as a part of the LOFAR 2.2 upgrade. Uh, thanks. All right, thank you, Bharat. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to post them in any of the channels we have available. I, I already see a hand up from Aaron. We'll take it away, Aaron. Sure, thanks. Um, 
But you were showing a picture of a of a cylindrical power spectrum, um, and you with the subtraction of the the Cygnus and the Cass, and showing the the res, change in the residual. It looked like there were some horizontal stripes going ac across that, particularly on the upper plot I was looking at. Um, yeah, and I was wondering if you could had any explanation for what those kind of horizontal stripes would be coming from. Um, so this is actually, um, this, the top plot is actually only uh, after direction independent calibration. So there can be some foreground variations. So this is, uh, I think that's what we are seeing here. It's, it, it's not been, uh, so I think uh, we have not subtracted any foreground from the above plot. So it's just the comparison between the two different calibration strategies. All right, and then there is a question from Josh, and you're also here as a panelist, so just ask your question here. Sure. Uh, I actually also had a question about this slide, which was, how are you distinguishing improvements, meaning lower power in that bottom right plot, from signal loss? Um, so this is only a comparison between the, so in, for example, in case of uh, previous, uh, in case of uh, direction dependent calibration where we did not fully enforce the smooth solutions, you do see uh, that structure. And uh, when we uh, do it, that structure disappears. And then we are actually uh, getting close to the uh, noise level. Also, uh, since we are using spect as spectrally smooth solution from a different set of baselines, uh, we are making sure that we are not removing any signal from the current. And this we have tested in in uh, simulations as well. There is a paper by Megas et al. 2021 that actually uh, delves deeper into this uh, point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bharat, again for your talk and answering those questions. Uh, it is then time for the next talk. Um, you can stop sharing your screen. And you, if you can start sharing your screen, oh, there you are. Uh, yep. Our next talk speaker is Hugh Garson from Queen Mary University of London. And you is going to talk to us about 21 centimeter power spectrum measurements at 48 megahertz using the Owens Valley Long Wavelength Array. Coming. That's right, take your time. Right. Yep, we can see that. All right. So I'll be talking about uh, this work that was published last year. Um, and these are the things that I'll focus on uh, for this talk, which might be a little different to what I would uh, talk about in other talks, but I'm assuming uh, we all kind of uh, uh, up with the theory, et cetera. So I don't need to go into that, which means that I can uh, spend a bit of time on other things. So I will talk about the telescope so it's the Owens Valley uh, interferometer. I'm not sure how many people actually know where that is. So I've got a kind of map here that you won't be able to see that well, but this is where it is. There's San Francisco, and down here is Los Angeles. So it's out uh, in, in the back blocks of California towards Nevada. Uh, so Caltech owns and manages the site. Pretty much all the hardware and backend software is uh, owned and, and managed by them. The telescope itself uses LWA 
antennas. So I've got a picture here of uh, the antennas on the ground. They are just uh, copies of the LWA, but five of them have been enhanced for radiometry experiments at, by a leader, by the leader group. So I was part of the uh, leader group, um, and I'll get to that a bit later. There are 256 uh, dipole antennas. They do go out to a couple of kilometers, but the ones that were used for this work are just uh, 200 meter baselines, up to 200 meter baselines. So 256 antennas gives you quite a lot of baselines. The frequency is 30 to 87 megahertz, which gives you a redshift of about 15 to 46. Um, channel width 24 kilohertz integration time uh, every nine seconds. So if the telescope was observing continuously, you'd get about 1.4 terabytes of data dumped every day. But we didn't do that, not continuously every day. Um, so, so where LIDAR uh, figures in, into this, uh, Caltech is uh, partnered with the LIDAR group at uh, Harvard Smithsonian CFA. The LIDAR group is uh, run by Lincoln Greenhill, he's a PI. Then there was a, a bunch of people who went through the, the leader group and I was the last one. Uh, so, but there are collaborators, so it's not sort of stopped. There are collaborators around the world. So we had full access to the telescope and we could uh, run our own observations and access the data, we also had some responsibilities. So for the actual power spectrum, we decided to use four hours. It takes, <clears throat> it took a lot of time for us to get clean data. So we kind of had to limit uh, the amount of data that we could use. We also, limited to this redshift. So we, what we do is we know that there are systematics like cable reflections, RFI, crosstalk, uh, mutual coupling, etc., in the data, but we don't have algorithms, models, etc., to kind of detect that and recovering, if we say, if it, if it could be recovered, say, get rid of the effect of cable reflections or something. So to get clean data, we basically have to find the good data and throw away uh, what we define as bad. We can't recover anything out of that because we don't have the uh, facilities to do it. So the three main techniques that we use to find clean data are a visual inspection of uh, the band pass of the antennas. We had sort of many days of data to begin with. So we just had to do, do this kind of randomly. So on the right, you can see a good and bad antenna, which a lot of you will be familiar with looking at, uh, for example, on other telescopes. But so we look, looked at plots like that on the right. We calibrated every nine second integration. Um, 
to see how well it calibrated. So we had calibration software that uh, is used by the MWA, it's called RTS, Real Time System, which does come up with some measures of calibration quality. And we also generated a power spectrum from every nine seconds integration that had kind of filtered through the previous two steps. So we had a, a simple in-house algorithm to score the power spectra. So out of that, we choose four, um, four hours of data assembled from lots of nine second integrations um, that are not contiguous, not even on the same day, uh, which kind of doesn't matter because we're going to incoherently average them. And the total amount of that four hours is about 240 gigabytes worth of data. Didn't do any further processing because we didn't have the facilities to do it, didn't have the software, the algorithms. But the RTS software did have a simple algorithm for flagging uh, channels that probably contained uh, RFI. So then we put that data into uh, uh, an in-house uh, software pipeline, which was written in C++ and multi-threaded and quite high performance. So it can process all of that data into a power spectrum, say overnight, because we need to run it several times if we're fiddling with things um, and initially to scan all the data. So after we've done that, we get a 2D wedge power spectrum. Now you could ask why we didn't use other software, for example, say here is software, and that is, um, well, there were reasons. This was about five years ago. So we weren't really sure what other software was out there, how well it performed, and if, if it was mature. So anyway, we built our own. So this is the power three spectrum. Left, Sorry? Yeah, three minutes left. OK. This is the power spectrum. Now this um, this telescope of the uh, LWA at Owens Valley was built for lots of different projects. It's general purpose. So we wanted to see if we could get a wedge out of a, just a general purpose interferometer. So we sort of did. Um, there's spillover outside the horizon. We don't exactly know what is causing that, but we also kind of should get edge brightening on the horizon. And we don't get that. So maybe the spillover has something to do with that, but there are definitely systematics in here um, that we couldn't remove, but we do kind of, we do have a wedge. Outside the wedge is pretty flat. There's linear features going across. I think some of them are due to cable reflections, but we couldn't pin that down. So we didn't say that in the paper, but we can take a measure of the power level outside the wedge, which is a delta squared of about 10 to the 12 millik squared. And Michael Eastwood, he actually used M mode analysis on the same telescope, lots more data at a different frequency, and he got 10 to the eight. So you've got those two values coming off the telescope. 
Um, we did do some simulations, which I'll sort of skip over, but noise simulations show that if we had 3,000 hours of data and could clean out the, sim the systematics, we would have enough sensitivity for a detection based on theoretical models. So what you can look at with this slide is the crosses are the sensitivity of the telescope if we do this 3,000 hours, and the lines are theoretical models. So if the crosses are below the lines, we might be able to detect those models. Um, so the telescope has not been operating for three years. Not sure if it's officially decommissioned. No one is working on data at Caltech or CFA because funding has sort of disappeared. At least at CFA, I know it has. But the data is there. So it, it would be worth, um, say, using HERA tools, which I'm familiar with now, to do some analysis on it. But it's the usual problem of uh, bodies, people who've got the time to do it. I don't have the time. If Lincoln can hire someone, that could maybe yeah, develop. But at the moment, it's kind of stalled. And I think people are, are thinking of uh, building a better telescope anyway, bigger and better. So I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you, you. Um, all right, let me just check if there are any questions in the chat. We are heading towards the end of this. I was just curious, you, you mentioned there is still lots of data out there. You only presented four hours. How many hours of data do you actually sort of have available if someone ever wants to uh, Yeah. Roughly. I can't remember now off the top of my head, but yeah, it's, it's years of observing over the um, winter, say, I don't know, thousands of hours, probably, can't remember, but lots, lots of it sitting on disk. Sounds um, like an interesting mind to potentially dig yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. That's All right. right. Thank you, you. Um, okay. If you can uh, stop sh screen sharing, then I'll start sharing for Kelly's talk. All right, the next talk is by Kelly Ferran from McGill University, who's going to give us a progress report on PRISM data analysis and calibration. Unfortunately, due to time zones, this didn't work for Kelly, so Kelly recorded her talk. To thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, this is pre-recorded because of time zone issues. Uh, but if you have any questions, please send them to me on Slack afterwards. So hi, my name is Kelly and I'm a PhD student at McGill. Today I'm going to be providing an update on the PRISM experiment. I will start with some background about what PRISM is and then I will discuss where we are at in terms of data collection and analysis. And I will be specifically focused on the calibration methods since that is where I've been putting my personal efforts. Okay, so I first want to mention that PRISM is a collaboration with members from various universities, um, both in North America and in South Africa. So you can see those relevant institutions listed here. So let's talk about what PRISM is. So PRISM is an acronym. It stands for Probing Radio Intensity at High Z from Marion. It is a global 21 centimeter experiment set up on Marion Island, which I will discuss where that is in just a minute. The PRISM setup consists of two dual polarization radiometers. 
and these antennas are operating at central frequencies of 70 megahertz and 100 megahertz. So together between the two antennas, there is frequency coverage from about 30 to 200 megahertz. And PRISM has been up and running since 2017. Okay, so there are a number of experiments that explore the global 21 centimeter signal. But what makes PRISM unique is its remote location. So the PRISM antennas are located on Marion Island, which is a small island about halfway between South Africa and Antarctica. So this makes it about 2,000 kilometers from the nearest permanent habitation. So if we look at this map here, we can see the tip of South Africa at the top, and we can see just the top of Antarctica at the bottom, and the red spot is where Marion Island is located. So if we zoom in on Marion Island, we can talk more about the PRISM setup. So in particular, PRISM is set up in sort of this northeast side of Marion Island, uh, the reason is that is where the main research base on Marion Island is located. So the island is used by a small group of South African researchers, um, but for the most part, it has very little activity and it's very remote. So this makes it pretty much RFI free in the frequency range that we're interested in. And this is a huge advantage since RFI or radio frequency interference is a major challenge for most global 21 centimeter experiments. So on top of being in a remote location, the actual PRISM setup is also four kilometers away from the main base on Marion Island. So as you can see here in the photo, the main base is kind of in the upper right side, um, and the PRISM experiment is about four kilometers inland from the base, and it is nestled behind Junior's Cop, which is sort of the highest hill in that area. So this location provides a shield for the experiment and further limits uh, any RFI that might be coming from the main base. Uh, the downside to this location is that it is a bit of a hike to get there from the base. And also just in general, the downside to being on Marion Island is that, as you can imagine, there are some logistical challenges. So there's, for example, a short access window each year. There's only about a three week period when we can access the island. There's also harsh weather, such as high winds, low temperatures. And we also have um, to deal with wildlife, in particular on the island, there's a bit of a mice issue. So a bit more about the instrument itself. You can see in this picture, uh, kind of the setup here on Marion Island. So in the background, you have Junior's Cop. Uh, so the main base would be in that direction. In the foreground, you can see the setup of the 70 megahertz antenna. And the 100 megahertz antenna is kind of on the right side in the background. You can also see uh, a set of shipping containers in this photo. Those are used to house electro spare parts and electronics and the different things we need to run the instrument. Um, so if you look at the 70 megahertz antenna in the foreground, you can see that it sits on top of a ground screen. Uh, that screen is roughly 10 meters on a side. And the antenna pedals at the top are supported by a fiberglass structure, which also houses the first stage electronics. So let's talk more about the instrument itself. So the prism radiometers use the four square antenna design that was previously used by the sci High experiment. Here you can see a schematic of the electronics. If we look at the first stage electronics, so that's the top of the picture, there are five switch states. So there's the antenna as it looks at the sky, and then there are four calibrator states. So those are 50 ohm and 100 ohm loads, and also a known noise source as well as a short state. The second stage electronics, which is at the bottom, are placed in a Faraday cage and um, put 50 meters away from the antenna itself so that we avoid any self-generated RFI. Um, so for a bit more information on the data collection, the auto and cross spectra for both polarization channels are written to disk about every four seconds. The spectra span 0 to 250 megahertz, uh, with that being in 4096 frequency channels. Um, the data acquisition rate 
is about 900 megabytes per day for both instruments combined. So this allows us to store several months of data on just the normal SD drive of the Raspberry Pi computer that we use to uh, kind of control the antennas. Okay, so let's look at some data. So the top graph uh, shows us the cadence of those switch states that I was speaking about before. So the antenna spends about 10 to 15 minutes looking at the sky, followed by one minute for each of the four calibrators. Um, and here's some example of some uncalibrated data. So if we look at the plot on the left, the bottom, we can see the 0 to 250 megahertz range of the frequencies. And we can also see that this particular piece of data spans about 26 hours of time. So the horizontal lines throughout this plot are of the calibrator states. So of course we need to filter those out to see uh, just the sky. So that's what's happening on the right hand side. The top on the right hand side, the top plot is um, after we've filtered out the calibrators. Um, and then on the right hand side on the bottom plot is some cross sections of that waterfall plot so that we can see the spectra of the sky here in black as well as the some of the calibrators which are the colored lines, the yellow and blue lines. Okay, so a little more information about our data. So far we've been focused on the 100 megahertz antenna and on data collected in mostly 2018 and a little bit in early 2019. Um, basically the reason for this is mostly due to the pandemic, we haven't had a chance to get back to the island and actually physically collect the data taken uh, in 2020 or 2021. So that's why we're still mostly focused on data from 2018. Um, though it's looking like in a few months, we're going to be able to get back to island and get all of our data from the years that have followed that. So that's very exciting. Anyways, from just the 100 megahertz antenna, and again, just in 2018, we're currently working with about 200 hours of data to develop our analysis and calibration pipelines so that when we do turn our attention to the 70 megahertz antenna as well as the future data that's coming in, um, we hope that we can easily and quickly sort of sort through it and calibrate it since we'll already have our methods set up. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the calibration of our data. So unfortunately, our ability to use a kind of direct calibration approach has been hindered by a lack of reliable S11 measurements. Basically, it's been difficult to get to the island, especially in the last few years, so we needed to adopt an approach that did not depend on having accurate measurements of the antenna's efficiency. What we have used instead is what we're calling the GSM calibration, which was first described in the Sci-High paper by Tabitha Wojtek and collaborators in 2014. And here are some of the main equations from her paper. And basically the general idea is that you use the global sky model, S or, or GSM, estimates of the sky temperature to fit for a calibration parameter that will minimize the differences between the measured temperatures and those GSM estimates. So the calibration parameter here in this case is what we're calling K. So we have basically taken this approach and we have changed it a little bit uh, for our own needs. So these are the equations that we're currently working with. The major differences um, is that we have uh, taken the antenna efficiency and uh, kind of put it inside of that calibration parameter K. And then also we are not going to be summing over time. So we are going to allow our calibration parameter to vary with both time and frequency. And essentially using this approach after we uh, solve for K to minimize this chi-squared equation, um, and then we remove the foregrounds from our data, which we've modeled with a third order polynomial, um, we are finding we get residuals around order unity, so between about 1 to 4 Kelvin. So this is a very simplistic approach, um, but it's been useful for right now to kind of get a general idea of the ballpark that our results are in. 
Okay, so looking forward on kind of the outlook for PRISM, there are a few uh, exciting pieces of news. So the first is that we currently have our inaugural winter over on site right now. So he is helping to keep the instrument in good health and keep the data rolling in. So it's very helpful to have someone present on Marion Island. Um, and so we're actually going to continue to have full winter over support for the upcoming year as well. Um, so hopefully with this winter over support, we're able to get some better S11 measurements as well as have the antenna up and running more consistently. Um, and then another exciting piece of news is what I've already mentioned before, that we have a deployment coming up to Marion in the next few months. And so that group should hopefully be able to bring back um, the actual drives with the data on it from the 2020 and 2021 seasons. Um, and so that's going to give us a lot more data to work with, which um, of course should improve our results. So thank you for your time. And again, if you have any questions, please don't be afraid to reach out on Slack to uh, Kelly Horn. All right, that was Kelly's. Hello, work. everyone. I'm Kanin Diao, and today I'm going to introduce my recent work, the realization okay. parameter inference from All a right. three dimensional Minkowski function. You're muted. Oh, um, muted. There we go. All right. So, um if you have any questions for kelly you can post them on slack she will be uh, checking the slack channel regularly over the coming week when the time zone is useful for her so feel free to reach out her, to her uh we're staying in single spectrometer element land for one more talk by jeffrey patterson from carnegie mellon university who will be giving us an update on the high z 21 centimeter global spectrometer all right yeah. See, uh, you're hearing me and seeing the screen. Yes. Okay, I'm going to tell you about HiZ, which is a, a 21 centimeter all sky a spectrometer that uh, operates across uh, three octaves uh, with a single antenna. Um, this is an idea that I uh, came up with in about 2016, uh, and I've been uh, continuously uh, modifying the experiment and deploying it. Uh, trying to do a better and better job of, um, of um, achieving the result we want. Uh, here's the rough outline. Um, this is a three octave antenna. It operates on the principle that it is uh, not a matched antenna. Most antennas in the uh, all sky uh, spectrum business uh, operate by uh, trying to achieve perfect efficiency. Uh, a perfect impedance match between the antenna and the uh, amplifier reading out that antenna. We abandon that approach and uh, use an unmatched antenna. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we have a frequency independent system in principle. Uh, and uh, so, so that, that's the concept. Um, I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, it's uh, uh, to do this, we need to read the antenna with an amplifier that has a higher impedance than the antenna. So we're watching the voltage on the antenna um, in the lowest order, uh, taking no current out of the antenna, just watching the waves bounce off the ground plane and affect the antenna as they go back out into space. No power absorption. Uh, and that can be done in a frequency independent way. Uh, it, uh, I'll show you also antenna patterns. Uh, this produces an, a very achromatic beam uh, which you all show. Uh, it's a portable system. It fits in a few suitcases, sets up in a day, uh, and that allows us to move the antenna around. Uh, we've had it at South Africa. We've had it at uh, Algonquin Radio Observatory, Green Bank Observatory, uh, and lately we've been using it in Northeastern Quebec. Uh, over the uh, pandemic period, we got locked out of the lab and I took si uh, this experiment home to the basement, IZ, of my house and I rebuilt the whole thing. <laughs> so, uh, so it was kind of my pandemic project to, um, uh, to rebuild the instrument, making all the changes I wanted to make. And since that time, we have uh, several months of, uh, of field tests of the instrument in its, in its most recent uh, configuration. And we have quite a lot of good data um, um, in the can. 
uh, you know, here's the basic concept. Uh, we, we have this feature, perhaps, uh, the, um, you know, the first star's cooling spectrum, the dip in the spectrum, perhaps at 70 megahertz or something, uh, maybe 20 megahertz wide. But we would like a much wider frequency range to find it because you need uh, to test for false positives in regions where the feature is not present. So one needs a, a wider frequency range than the line you're looking for. Uh, and so you need a multi-octave experiment if you want to do this well. So that was the idea. We want a multi-octave experiment. Um, if you make a short antenna, push a wire through a hole in a ground plane, it will sense the electric field. You can connect that to a infinite impedance amplifier and electrometer. And the voltage on this wire will swing up and down as the electric field varies, and that's frequency independent uh, at long wavelengths. So uh, we describe the antenna in terms of its effective height. Uh, the voltage that would be created on this wire is the length of the antenna times the electric field, a uh, times some factor that adjusts for the fact that uh, perhaps there are, there are small currents that are flowing in the antenna. So the effective height quantity is a number of order one, uh, which tells you how uh, departures from true flatness of the antenna. Uh, this is used, uh, it's not a new idea. Uh, it was new to me, but then I did the research and I found out you can buy a calibrated antenna for use in EMI testing. Uh, and uh, those generally work below 30 megahertz and uh, you know, they're quite expensive there because they come with a, a, you know, a traceable calibration. But in, anyway, uh, I, I acquired one of those and tested it and uh, and we went from there with our own design. Uh, lately, we've been using this uh, site in Northeastern Quebec, um, Manicouagan area, Wapishka Research Station. Uh, and uh, it's a two and a half day drive from Pittsburgh. Uh, if you have a little airplane, uh, you can fit the experiment in the right seat and uh, get, get back and forth in a single day. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's, it's pretty quiet. Uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you Spectre, including RFI. Uh, it's not a bad site. And of course, with the pandemic, we couldn't get back to South Africa. So this is what we've been doing for the past uh, year or so. Uh, this is uh, Sebastian Gamboa. He's one of the key, uh, key uh, players in the most recent observations. And uh, uh, this is the new radome um, that, we, we, that I, you know, I built for the new version of the, of the instrument. Um, this is the, uh, the key switch in the antenna. It's a mechanical switch. There's a little vein in there that is um, uh, moved by a uh, latching relay, uh, and uh, it's designed to be a 50 ohm switch. But I machined it custom, uh, custom machined it uh, to bring the antenna terminal. This you're looking for the back side of the box, which is eventually buried. But uh, the the vein contacts the actual antenna terminal. I, I, you know, I deleted right here would be the uh, the connector for the other side of the switch. That's gone and the vein touches the actual antenna terminal. Uh, and that's to reduce uh, impedance and delay line effects between the amplifier and the antenna itself, uh, or, uh, capacitance, capacitive loading. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's it. The electronics is very simple. Uh, we've, uh, most of our data from the summer used a very simple calibration system, a 50 ohm load and a, a 15 dB ENR noise source. Uh, those um, were the two calibration positions. Uh, we're going back to the um, sci-high and prism style calibration with multi-level calibration uh, so we understand more of the linearity of our system. Um, but yeah, I also made new antennas. Uh, there are four scaled antennas uh, scaled by 33% uh, each from the next, from the smaller uh, antenna made out of uh, eight mil stainless steel spot welded and uh, some nicely machined little brass bits that were fun to make. Um, recently, we've added a new amplifier. Uh, this is an amplifier designed for use really on Hyrex, uh, but I modified it for use on hi -Z. I I am able to create a high input impedance on this amplifier by loading the output. It turns out this is commonly true for a lot of amplifier chips. Um, if you reduce the impedance at the output, the impedance at the input goes up. So I loaded the heck of the, the output with a 10 ohm resistor and that gave me an input impedance that was higher than the antenna. Uh, uh, this is then a very quiet amplifier, uh, much quieter than the amplifier we've, we've been using before. About half our data from last year uh, is with a, 
an op amp, uh, and uh, uh, half is with this new um, new very low noise amplifier. Uh, so that's what we're doing lately with the amplifier. Uh, here's some data. Uh, you, um, this is a waterfall plot, uh, not 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 a full day, just a few hours of data here, uh, and um, the uh, yellow part is the is the brighter flux, uh, and this is uh, one of our larger antennas, which has within its band uh, the quarter wave resonance that a, a, a vertical antenna will have, but it's very broadened resonance. Uh, this is this broad band here, uh, because we're not attempting to match the antenna. Uh, and you can see RFI here as well. Uh, our flagging system is doing a good job of flagging the RFI. And uh, just for illustration purposes, we we replaced the flagged regions with with an average, uh, just just to show uh, how well the flagging is is working. Um, here's a little bit more detail on that. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, yeah. So here's a flagged data. Uh, this is the FM band in the middle, and you can see uh, this was during the Perseid meteor shower. So we see a lot of these meteor scatter events where the entire FM band lights up, right? Um, Orbcom, this is Orbcom. Um, other familiar, uh, all, all the RFI experts will recognize uh, features here. Um, and this is the data, uh, you know, with the replacement of the flag data with the local averages. So the flagging, I think, is working, working quite well. I want to do better in terms of RFI removal, and I want to try a trick that I don't think has tried yet, been tried yet, uh, which is that in between each FM station and the next, there's a there's a dead band. So uh, in US and Canada, uh, FM stations are on odd multiples of 100 kilohertz. Uh, you know, 99.1, 99.3, 99.2 is not occupied. The assigned bandwidth is 50 kilohertz, so there's actually a blank space in between every FM station. And this is some data you see from Green Bank uh, during a thunderstorm where there was a lot of reflections of the FM signals, the red curve. Uh, this is not resolving that blank spot in between. We didn't have the spectrometer resolution to do that. So one of the things I want to do is to increase the spectrometer resolution. So I can compare the odd multiples to the even multiples. The even multiples ostensibly being free of RFI, the odd multiples telling you how bad the RFI is in band. Uh, and that will give us a control, uh, a, um, a, uh, a measurement of how good we're doing at cutting the RFI. So this is very important because this band is 20 megahertz wide. If you over subtract it, you could put a 20 megahertz feature into your spectrum, right? So, um, uh, or you could uh, you misinterpret one edge or the other of it as the edge of a of a uh, of a first star signal. Yeah, three so, minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, so I, I I want to work on the spectrometer, uh, increasing the um, spectral resolution in order to uh, to do this uh, odd even test. Um, here are some plots of the um, a measurement of the S11 of the antenna. Extremely smooth and simple. Actually, it's not quite perfect. Uh, maybe uh, there's like a kink right here. You see, maybe, maybe uh, your eyes are good enough to see that. Uh, that's from the cable, standing wave in the cable that runs between our a half meter cable between our uh, VNA and the antenna. Uh, we can get rid of that, so, um, so we can do better. But uh, this is a, a gamma 1% precision measurement of the uh, reflection coefficient. Uh, we, uh, that's about what we need. But we, we would like to do you know ten to the minus three, and I think we can do that if we if we uh, use one of these new small spec uh, VNAs and and uh, and put it inside the uh, the RF box. Uh, here's the uh, chromaticity of the antenna patterns, uh, extremely achromatic, right? As you can see, uh, this is with the old op amp um, loading the antenna, uh, and here's with the new amplifier, and you can see particularly at low frequencies, uh, the, the signal has come down. And that's because our new amplifier, in order to get its low noise, does have a higher input capacitance. So it, it is loading the antenna a bit. What else is there to say? Um, I've got to hurry up here. One of the things we do is to measure the uh, soil properties at our site by using two of our radial wires. We have radial, a ground plane radial system, 40 meters long. We, we start with two of them on the ground, we drive it with the VNA at the center, uh, and that tells us how much 
energy is reflecting from the ends of those wires. Uh, and also um, the damping of it tells you the loss into the soil. So you can back out the loss tangent and permittivity of the soil from this. Um, and we do that with FICO, and then we use those parameters in our FICO simulations of the antenna. All right. Um, all right, so here's where we, at. we stand. Uh, we've already carried out our lab calibration, um, uh, and we're analyzing uh, about 30 days of data right now. We have built a, a version of the SciHi or PRISM uh, multi-level uh, calibrator system, so we'll be uh, uh, switching to that. And we hope to get back up to Wapishka in June. I maybe can do better with the LNA or thinking a little bit about that. And I'm thinking about replacing the sampling system, perhaps with a uh, RF system on chip design uh, using the new Xilinx chips. So anyway, uh, that's where we stand and um, I'll stop for questions. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I already see that Aaron has his hand up. So go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I'm quick on the draw. Uh, yeah, this is really, really interesting uh, work here. I was wondering what kind of receiver temperature you're getting since these high impedance systems have trouble, uh, I think, with their receiver noise being well, a large fraction of the input signal. Yeah, uh, we had a, an effective uh, uh, noise temperature with the op amp of around 500 Kelvin. Uh, but remember the antenna is inefficient. So um, it is attenuating signals from the sky it's doing that in a uniform way, but, um, but uh, uh, we were amplifier dominated with that. In other words, that, that was brighter than the uh, effective temperature of the sky after the antenna's attenuation. Uh, the new amplifier is about 40 Kelvin. So it's, it's dramatically better. And uh, so uh, we're, we're now once again, sky limited with the, the, the new amplifier. But uh, uh, it's a large part of the noise budget. We have to understand it very well and subtract it properly to get the, the global signal. Um, it's, uh, with the new amplifier, it's no longer dominant. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks for the question, Aaron. We've reached the end of question time for Jeff. Uh, I would like to point out that Josh asked a question for Jeff as well on the Slack channel. So if you could respond to that and take the conversation there. Um, thank you again, Jeff. And we're gonna go to the next talk by Nicholas Korn from MIT, who's going to talk to us about, yeah, there we go, systematic modeling and validation for HERAS phase one EOR limits. Great, thanks Ronnie. And uh, thanks to uh, the SOC and the LSE. Um, right, as Ronnie said, my name is Nick. Um, I am an MIT popular fellow um, and I'll be talking about some of the advances that we've made at HERA for systematic modeling and validation, uh, specifically for the phase one limits that um, I led along with a couple, a couple other people at HERA um, that we put out late, uh, earlier this year. So as a lot of you are probably familiar with, and as Aaron Parsons alluded to uh, earlier on, we've set some new limits uh, from HERA that uh, were actually published this year. Um, they're shown here in pink. Uh, this is the state of the, of the field right now in terms of upper limits on the power spectrum. Um, you, you can see to date, they're, um, they're fairly sensitive. They're at redshift eight. It's an order of order over an order of magnitude improvement. Um, and what I'll be talking about in this talk is two things. One, what made this possible? Um, and second, why do we actually believe these limits and what are we doing now and going forward to build confidence in uh, Harris pipeline? And the thing that I'll come back to that um, I think uh, should, be, should be mentioned when we give these talks is that the Hera limits were achieved with no foreground subtraction at all. And this undergirds Hera's approach as Aaron alluded to, which is that of foreground containment rather than foreground subtraction. Okay, so to talk about some of the systematic challenges we're seeing in Hera, it's best to just dive right in to look at some power spectra. So I'm showing you power spectra from Hera uh, as a function of integration time going to the right. You're seeing we, de we detect the foregrounds at, at low K modes uh, very strongly and that bottoms out to a noise floor. Uh, and as we integrate down you know, by orders of magnitude, we eventually see something that pops up out of the noise floor uh, right where we wanna actually measure the EOR. Uh, and indeed this is a systematic. So we spent a decent amount of time understanding what this is for the phase one system, including a combination of uh, numerical and analytic techniques um, to understand its phenomenology. And it, it turns out that it can be distilled down to uh, a set of instrumental coupling systematics, including reflections within the cables that connect our antennas to our correlator uh, and reflections within our array. 
So I'll talk about some of the, uh, the ways in which we're modeling this, and it basically boils down to, um, to uh, multidimensional Fourier analysis. Um, so not, not too complex here, but um, I'll, I'll demonstrate this by, by showing you some simulated data. So this is simulated foregrounds as a function of local sidereal time for Hera and frequency uh, with these systematics uh, injected into them. And what I've done here is I've gone from the native data space, so LST and frequency, into this two-dimensional Fourier space, simply taking an FFT along both of these axes. Uh, and what you see is that these, these terms separate out ver uh, very cleanly. Um, you have an intrinsic foreground signal that's isolated to low delays, and you have this coupling and this reflection signal that I've inserted into the simulation. And this is the basis for how we're actually uh, trying to uh, separate out the signals from the intrinsic sky signals, particularly the EOR signal, which if you plotted in this space would occupy a footprint that looks something like this, right? So one of the ways that we deal with coupling, in fact, the main way we, we deal with it right now is just by developing tailored Fourier filters to uh, reject it. Now it turns out that the, the reflection, the signal chain reflection is a little more complicated. Obviously it, it overlaps the EOR in this space. Um, and I'll talk about that, how we deal with that in a second. But if you look at real data, so now this is real data in the same two dimensional Fourier space, uh, you can see a lot of the similar features I just showed you. You have this intrinsic foreground structure at low delay, and you have this uh, horizontal stripe, which is this, this coupling systematic. Um, I should say this is um, what you might consider like a first order coupling systematic. We've done some more work recently um, from Alex Josidis, who's looked at higher order coupling systematics, which is more relevant for the phase two system, which I won't talk about, but I think Josh will get a little bit into that. But what you see is when you apply these tailored Fourier filters, you get a nice rejection of this coupling systematic at the, um, the delay modes that we actually wanna measure the EOR signal. And in the second half of this talk, I'll get back to why we, why we actually believe this subtraction and why we think we're not you know, over subtracting any EOR signal. Now, as I showed you, showed you, you can actually see the cable reflection right here. Uh, this is in a cross correlation visibility. The reflections are actually better dealt in the autos. You have higher SNR uh, and you can see them more easily. So this is showing you the uh, delay spectrum of an auto correlation visibility. And you know the, the autocorrelation has an intrinsic um, spread to it, but you can see particularly at the delays that correspond to the cable lengths that we have for these two cables, you see a clear um, uh, reflection term that comes up out, out of this, um, this background. So we have a, an algorithm that I've developed that, that actually fits for these uh, reflection parameters, the amplitude, phase, and delay, uh, and then folds them into our bandpass calibration. And in this case, you're seeing a factor of a few upwards to over an order of magnitude in suppression of these cable terms. Right, so what is the end result? So uh, this is what that looks like on the full data set. So this is showing you, uh, you can think of this as a time ordered power spectrum waterfall. On the left, you're seeing what the intrinsic power spectra look like after our simple calibration with no systematic mitigation. You see the foregrounds here, very bright. And then you see this double lobed instrumental coupling signals after applying these uh, systematic rejection techniques, you get a nice uh, subtraction of the foregrounds, uh, sorry, of the systematics uh, and down to what looks to be this kind of uh, even noise floor, right? Um, so that's nice. And this is part of what has enabled the sensitivity of Hera's recent limits. And another way to say that is to look at the achieved dynamic range between that intrinsic foreground signal that we were looking at and that noise floor that we're able to recover. So this is showing you the power spectra normalized by the peak foreground power at the zeroth Fourier mode here. And what you find is for the fields that, that we're looking at, um, we're able to achieve a dynamic range in power of about 10 to the nine, right? Which is, which is quite deep. Um, and, and this kind of highlights Hera's approach, right? Rather than trying to model this foreground lobe here, we're doing everything that we can, both from an instrument perspective, building a smooth instrument, but also from an analysis perspective is, is building a pipeline that not only rejects uh, and can mitigate some of the leakage, but maintains that structure as we do things like apply calibration or RFI flag, this kind of thing, right? Uh, and another way to look at that is to say that, well, at, at, at the ERR window, we can measure the noise. And so what you're seeing here are two-dimensional power spectra as a function of K parallel and K perpendicular. On top, these are the three fields that we look at for the phase one data set. And on bottom, you're seeing the ratio of that measured power with the uh, noise amplitude that, that we expect. And so of course, you know, at low K parallel, you see a lot of foreground power. We're not really trying to remove that at least for now, um, but above the wedge plus some buffer uh, denoted by this black line, you're seeing a structure that looks largely noise-like. So it's fluctuating positive negative and it has roughly unit variance, right? 
So that's been a nice proof of concept of both the instrument itself uh, and the analysis pipeline that we've developed that we're continuing to approve upon and apply to, as Josh will talk about, more phase one data and, uh, and, and, and phase two data. Um, but what I'll talk about next is what we're doing to build confidence in that, uh, in that result. How do we know we're not over subtracting EOR signal um, when we're applying these kinds of systematic filters? And this kind of underscores a, a concerted effort within Hera uh, to, uh, to build a validation team and to validate our pipeline. And it's been really, really nice that this is effectively de facto the standard for any major uh, power spectrum limit um, from uh, a lot of the collaborations out there. So that's great. So how do we approach this from Hera? Well, it's kind of a healthy mix of simulated end-to-end -end trials in addition to some statistical tests on data to ensure that our results are both unbiased and that we have robust error propagation. And a lot of this is summarized in that HERA paper, but I would point you also to the validation paper um, that was spearheaded, um, that I was involved with, but spearheaded mainly by these four people here, um, as well as some other papers that look at error, uh, error estimation, um, et cetera. Right, and so uh, Aaron showed this plot, but um, this is a high level overview of the validation pipeline um, as it was in 2021 and we've since improved upon it, but you can see on the left, we have various sky models, foregrounds for EOR. We push that through um, a couple different visibility simulators, actually. We inject all kinds of systematics to try to make our simulated data look as realistic as possible, including uh, gains, coupling, reflections. And then we push this through our standard pipeline. So calibration, uh, flagging systematic, uh, sorry, actually not flagging in this case, but systematic subtraction, and then power spectrum estimation to try to see does our result on the mocks match what we know we put in. And I'll say one of the things that this helped us to do, you know, there's a number of known systematics that we want to ensure that we're uh, that we're subtracting properly and that we recovered an unbiased estimate. But there was an unknown unknown that this uh, exercise helped us discover, which was an eight, an eight percent bias and our absolute calibration, which we then uh, went back and fixed. So that was something uh, something nice that came out of this, this 2021 paper. And one of the ultimate goals, right, of, of this exercise is to try to simulate realistically corrupted data. So this is an example of what that looks like from this uh, validation paper. So on the top, you're seeing, again, this two-dimensional Fourier space for one of the visibilities we simulate. There's a couple of different components. There's an EOR signal, which is this horizontal stripe. There's a foreground signature at low delays, and there's also reflections and coupling, which you can see at higher delays. And when you actually channelize this at the bandwidth uh, that we use for power spectrum estimation, it looks like, and then you insert noise, uh, what you see is on the bottom right. So this is a, a, a mock corrupted visibility um, on, the, on the lower right. And it looks fairly uh, similar to real phase one data on the lower left, right? So there's, there's some inconsistencies, which we're always trying to improve, but to first order, this is a a fairly good um, faithful representation of the corrupted data, which we then push through our systematic removal and power spectrum estimation pipelines. And a couple of tests that we did, uh, including unit tests on individual blocks, but the, the big uh, hitter here is the end-to-end -end test and the recovery of a known input power spectrum. So that's what this is showing. Um, this is showing you the power spectra of the validation simulations, right? After calibration, systematic subtraction, and what we're doing here is just averaging the power spectra together. So you can think of that as an effective integration time. And that lowers the noise floor. And what you want to see is that when that noise floor dips below an, an input EOR power spectrum in the data, that you can recover that power spectrum without, uh, without loss. Right? So that's what you're seeing here. As we integrate more and more um, baselines together, the noise floor goes down. And at the K modes where we actually would measure a detection based on this particular EOR power spectrum that we just, that we just sampled, um, this pink line does show that it actually does recover this out of the noise floor. We're not suppressing it with the various filters and calibration um, pipelines that we're, we're applying. Right, so that's the simulated uh, data. Um, there's some other, there's a number of statistical tests, which I, I really won't go into. This is my last slide here. Um, but uh, to give you a flavor for some of the things that we're looking at, some of the things that we're looking at are signal loss due to decoherence when you're redundantly averaging visibilities. And this is something that's unique to a redundant array like HERA, where we can actually directly average coherently, so in, 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 in complex space, the visibilities together. Um, now you can imagine if there is a phase offset, say between those visibilities, perhaps due to calibration errors or primary beam non-redundancies, um, then you will actually decohere that sky signal a little bit, right? The phases are not perfectly aligned and you will get signal loss. 
And because this coherent uh, averaging across redundancy is one of the things that makes Hera so sensitive to the power spectrum, we wanted to ensure that this was not uh, a showstopper. So we come up with a metric, which is we compute um, a power spectrum that's been coherently averaged using the complex visibilities, and then one that's been incoherently averaged. So it's not using that complex information. And if you had no phase, phase offsets, no, phase, uh, no signal loss, you'd expect those to be roughly the same up to a thermal noise difference. Um, and if you had phase errors, then you would expect loss. And so this is showing you what that looks like on the foregrounds. So this is real data um, for a couple of different redundant groups. And you can see that this loss is about a percent level, right? So it's there, but we expect it. Our instrument's not perfect, but it's at the percent level, right? And so we then we go back and we actually correct for this. And the last test I'll mention, this is going back to simulation land, is for a drift scan array like Hera, you're going to get decoherence as you average the data coherently as a function of LST. You're looking at slightly different parts of the sky. Um, and we want to maximize that integration time to beat down thermal noise while minimizing that loss. So for the integration time that we picked, we can go ahead and simulate the amount of loss that we get from, say, a visibility simulation. Uh, and again, this is a percent level. So we can actually go back and we're, we're, we're producing percent level corrections to our power spectra, um, even though, again, our over, uh, our leading uncertainty on, on, the, on the flux scale is about 10%, right? That's the APSCAL flux uncertainty for these kind of experiments. So um, our, the last slide is, uh, you know, our, we've done a, a fairly rigorous job trying to quantify the systematic biases and we've corrected for them. We keep them to within 10 to 15%, which is our, our flux scale uncertainty. And with this pipeline that we've developed, we've been able to achieve a, a dynamic range between the foregrounds and the noise of 10 to the nine, uh, leading to, um, a, you know, new upper limits at redshift eight, which are the most sensitive to date. Um, and again, this just underscores the importance that we're currently working on to improve the validation pipeline uh, as we push towards the first detection with phase two. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you, Nick. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Um, if I, don't see you. I was just curious about the 8% error you detected like through your validation pipeline. So you, you briefly mentioned, it sounded like it's an overall flux scale error in the Glean catalog, or is it, so yeah, it actually it's it's interesting. It it, it it's not a, uh, the reason why we have that is because we're calibrating every single integration in our data, um, and not all integrations see a high SNR. Um, and we were using we were using a logarithmically linearized ABSCAL, which is actually biased in the limit that you have high you have low SNR. So it was because we were um, ABSCALing uh, low SNR data with a biased calibrator um, that caused that. Uh, that bias. When we calibrate nominal fields that have high SNR, then you don't really see this bias. Um, so it wasn't. It didn't have to do with Gleam, but as you point out, Gleam has a leading uncertainty of about 10%. So you know the biases that I'm talking about here that we're actually correcting for are within roughly uh, our overall uncertainty, anyways, about 10%. All right. Thank you for that. Um, all right, that was our penultimate talk. And this brings us back to UC Berkeley where Josh Dillon is going to talk about the future of the hydrogen epoch of reionization array. It helps if I unmute myself. Yeah, so, so thanks so much. And uh, Thanks especially to Nick and Aaron, who both have given an excellent set of backgrounds that will make this, uh, this talk hopefully more comprehensible. So I'm gonna talk about what comes next. So Nick has led this incredible effort to produce the first upper limits from Hera, uh, which has then sort of put us on the big board, so to speak. Uh, and we've set the deepest limits on the high Z21 centimeter power spectrum, which is really exciting. We've still got a ways to go to the fiducial kind of signal that we're looking to, uh, to probe and to really characterize. So one of the easiest ways, of course, to go deeper is just to use more data. And Aaron alluded to this. So this limit that we published was just from 18 nights of data. But from that season of observation with the what we call the Hera phase one system, we have a full season to look at, which was split up into uh, four different epics, which I'll come back to, with a roughly similar number of antennas, even though we were adding antennas over the season. It was an old system that was degrading over time. So roughly a similar number of antennas, but it's just a factor of something like five more data. So if you just look at the sort of LST coverage of this, you know, this first bit of data that we published on that 18 nights versus what we're planning to publish on and what we've really been pushing forward after doing all kinds of data quality checks and looking at hundreds of Jupyter notebooks, we've got a lot more raw sensitivity. And as Nick showed, 
outside of that foreground nominated region, it seems like uh, noise was actually limiting us on a number of K modes of interest. So in general, we're trying to take that same data analysis approach and apply that to the larger data set. And it's been working really, really well, uh, but there's been a few things that have been sort of snags along the way, and I wanted to highlight one of them. So Nick spent a long time talking about the mitigation of these systematics, and in particular, he showed this idea where you can look at fringe rate and delay space for these systematics and separate out, for example, the fringe rates, the cross-coupling, which was one of the most important systematics, lives at this fringe rate zero, whereas the sky region of interest uh, is not necessarily at fringe rate zero and depends on, on which baseline we're talking about. So that was one of the key things for this. And that technique didn't work, at least initially, quite as well on the full season of data. So we applied these filters to the full season of data, and we were seeing considerable residuals. And when we dig back into what was going on, what we saw was that while you know, this is relying on the time stability as a function of, say, LST, of this complicated signal here, we're looking at it at a range of delays and looking at the real part of the Fourier transform visibility. And we saw that there were changes in time. And those things, when you throw away the time constant part, will, allow, will mean that you still have something remaining. So that was something that we had to really dig into. And there's a long and kind of fun detective story of figuring out what this comes from and why it happens. But eventually what we realized is that it was over the air transmission that was creating this crosstalk feature, probably from these receiverators, which were literally refrigerators with receivers in them. Uh, and what we realized is that because as the array was changing over time, instead of trying to subtract this crosstalk as, a, as almost the last step, instead what we do is we looked at the crosstalk one epic by epic throughout that data. So what we noticed is that there was a correlation between when different parts of the data were, you know, as we observed different LSTs, and when these things seem to have some sort of transition. And so just by uh, doing it epic by epic, we found that we could remove the crosstalk in the regions that we cared about much, much better. And we sort of left the galactic center. We didn't bother to try to remove the crosstalk there because the galactic center is so bright, we really can't observe. Uh, so the good news is that it looks now like our results, as Nick was showing before, are quite consistent with thermal noise in much of the, what we call the EOR window up here. Uh, and here I'm showing the ratio, sort of the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and it's sort of very, it's very uh, confidence building that we can see that it looks like we can keep integrating down. I'm not yet quite ready to share what, what the results will be. So I've blocked out the color scale here, but hopefully within uh, this year, we should be able to be in a position where we really crossed all the, the T's and dotted all the I's and are able to release these results. So we're running, as Nick described, we're, do, we're running the same playbook. We're doing the same sort of end-to-end -end validation simulations. We're also running these statistical text, tests and jackknives. But from a pure sensitivity perspective, it could be as much as three times deeper. I don't think we will quite achieve that, but that's the kind of level of sensitivity that we're talking about, which will put us perhaps not in the detection territory, but at least an interesting upper limit territory. Meanwhile, as Aaron was talking about, uh, we are continuing to build out to our, our full array. So we've built almost all of the dishes now and we're continuing to instrument them as we go. Uh, but the key thing is that we've replaced the signal chain. So Aaron's talked quite a bit about this earlier in the session. There's now no receiverators. We're using the wideband feeds, which allow us to probe a much uh, larger range of redshifts and also have a greater lever arm on the foregrounds. Uh, and with that many antennas, the, the problem of antenna quality has become increasingly salient. So one of the ways that we've, uh, and this was work led by a graduate student at the University of Washington, Dara Storer, uh, we, we, we pioneered a technique using interleaved time samples or even and odd time sample visibilities. And we looked at the cross correlation of them for the same pair of antennas, just numbers that should be either the same if we're talking about signal or should be completely different if we're talking about noise. And one of the things that looking at this statistic for every pair of antennas, which is say every visibility, is it was very clearly highlighting antennas that were not working properly or not correlating properly, either because they're dead or because the clock wasn't distributed appropriately, things like that, that then allow us to go you know, generate these plots basically on a daily basis and diagnose them in the field. And likewise, we were able to detect using combinations of polarizations when, for example, uh, you know, the two polarizations cables were literally swapped. And that's another thing that we can tell the folks out in the field to go fix. So that statistic has been really powerful. Another one, and I won't go too much into this that we developed, was looking at the autocorrelations and, and averaging them down in various senses to a spectrum to look for things like 
anomalous temporal variability or temporal discontinuities, things that we're busy tracking down the physical origin of, but at least tell us that there's something suspicious about a particular antenna, that it is a statistical outlier in some sense, and that it ought to be uh, removed from our highest quality data set. So we're always worried about you know, low-level systematics that completely swamp the very faint 21 centimeter signal. So the good news is that this has allowed us to intake a lot of data and try to find the best data. The bad news is that a lot of the data that we took basically over the pandemic was a lot rougher than we'd hoped because we really have lacked site access and the ability to go fix things down on site. Now that's changing, but still we're hoping to be able to publish with a handful of nights, kind of similar to, the, to what we've done um, for stage one. And then in the in upcoming seasons, we'll be able to have a lot more data from more antennas and more nights as we're able to fix the things that are broken on site and access it more easily. Um, so Aaron Ewell Weiss, as, as Aaron mentioned, is leading this, uh, this work and he's looking at uh, a wide range of bands. So we're able to access way more frequency bands than we were before. Uh, we're still looking at sort of similar fields, perhaps, perhaps we'll include more. This is still very much in prep, but it looks like we're able to do upper limits across a wide range of redshifts, which will be interesting for constraining our cosmological models and also pushing down toward the low redshifts where, uh, sorry, the low frequencies or high redshifts where we have very little constraints. So once again, as perhaps is not so surprising, this cross-coupling phenomenon which is, uh, is manifesting itself in a little bit of a different way. Um, so this is work that, that Nick mentioned by Alex Josiatis, where what we're seeing is that without cross-coupling, two baselines that are supposed to be measuring the same thing, of course, look the same. But when you include these mutual coupling effects, you start to see complicated structures in fringe rate and delay space due to uh, effectively all of these antennas seeing each other to some, to some extent. But uh, when, we, and when we look at this in real data, we're starting to see the exact same sort of phenomena. We're seeing sort of almost like a cross or a stripe uh, pattern here that we think is due to the same effect. So this is leading us to an approach where we're saying, let's think about being more aggressive in how we're filtering in fringe rate, or you can think of this equivalently as a very fancy sort of time average, and really just focus on the fringe rates that are consistent with the main beam, uh, the, you know, the brightest part, which is also, we believe, here where we'll be able to have sensitivity to the, to the EOR. So the idea is to reject the portion that is due to mutual coupling, uh, or at least, mitigate it substantially. So this seems to be working fairly well. This is very preliminary work by Aaron Ewell Weiss, but what he was showing is that mitigating, the, you know, doing this kind of fancy time averaging is really bringing the limits down. Now, just bringing the limits down is not good enough. We also need to show that we're not losing cosmological signal, but that's where, uh, that's where we're headed. So finally, as, we, you know, as we're building out to build the full instrument, what I'm excited about is, is the capacity to do the really interesting cosmology that we've been promising for years to do. So with the full Hera 360 and an, a season of observation, we should have plenty of signal to noise to observe the, at the EOR redshifts and really have a, a characterization of what the 21 centimeter signal looks like at EOR. But also I think we will have substantial signal to noise to say something about what's going on at higher redshifts as well in a fiducial scenario or one of these more contrived scenarios that's trying to explain the edges signal. For example, I think if edges is real, it's really hard to make something that bright that's not also visible on the power spectrum. And so we should be able to have a very independent check of edges with by measuring the, the interferometric signal at high redshift. But regardless, we should be able to actually use this information about, about reionization to really pin down the reionization history of the universe and get error bars on when reionization happened and how long it took. It looks something like this. And I think that that's really exciting because that'll be one of our first major contributions to cosmology. We can basically tell our friends who work on the CMB what tau is. We can eliminate the optical depth of reionization as a nuisance parameter for the CMB which allows substantial reduction in, for example, the amplitude of, of scalar fluctuations from inflation, a, a, a reduction in the error bars on that quantity. And actually, I, what I think is really interesting is the potential by eliminating that nuisance parameter to measure the sum of the neutrino masses and help distinguish between the normal and hi inverted hierarchy. So that's, I think, really exciting in a way in which this will contribute to cosmology in a substantial way in the relatively near future. So to sum up, since I think I'm almost out of time or even over time, we're, we're, we are 
full steam ahead on, on this full season of analysis. And we're really digging down and trying to get close as close as we can to the thermal noise limits. And we're using the same tools that, that Nick really pioneered uh, and others in the collaboration to validate and cross-check those limits. Meanwhile, we're trying to do some of the similar things on, on the phase two data. And while we were slowed down by COVID, we were spending the time trying to understand how new systematics look in the array. Um, and finally, within the next few years, we should have you know, a full deep season of data where we really understand what's going on and we can use that to tightly constrain the astrophysics of reionization. So that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Josh. Um, let's see if there are any questions. I was actually just curious, what did you end up doing with the receiver raters? Um, I don't know. Does maybe Aaron knows? I think they're still on the, the they're still there on the ground. But I, I think what you mean maybe is, uh, are they still part of the signal chain? And the answer is is no. Um, so they are not currently being used. That, uh, in in some sense, Hera phase two was the same dishes, but literally everything else was replaced. The uh, the F engines, the X engines, the signal chain, the feeds, as I mentioned, it's all a different telescope. Okay. If you want to buy and make us an offer. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I don't think anyone's like uh, keeping drinks cool in the career. <laughs> no, sad. <laughs> Uh, I don't see any further questions appearing on Slack or here on Zoom. I do recommend everyone, if you're watching this later on, feel free to ask your questions there on the 2022 1B channel. Um, I hope all of you. Are yeah. No. Sorry, I, I do think there's a question from Jeff. Is uh, there? It's not on the thread. It's just in the in the channel. Oh, I think that's a response to oh, Josh. It was a response. Oh. Jeff. Yeah, you're right. Thank so, you. Just so you know, Josh, uh, Jeff is responding in a separate thread to you. Thanks, your... Jeff. I'll, I'll, I will. I will look at it. Uh, yeah, I'm not very slack adept there. I, I that, typed the wrong spot. That that's fine. That's yeah. fine. All right. That closes off the second session of our first day of Sazerac uh, on updates on experiments. I don't know if there's any housekeeping from the organizers. Uh, no, only that we'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. GMT for the foreground session. And feel free to use Slack in the meantime. It's uh, it's there for that. Right, and just to say thank you again to all the speakers and thanks to Ronnie for chairing the session. Thanks so much. See y'all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Raul, if you're here, uh, <laughs> can you can you stay so that we discuss a little bit tomorrow's organization? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was Very just well. typing on on Slack. Uh, whether okay. or not you were going to make me a host for the next session. So, <laughs> yeah, you, we were trying to figure that out actually. Um, Do we want to stop the recording?